Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sego ani buju endio wachaya kwe kwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So we were just meeting in committee of the whole closed meeting. We did discuss one item with respect to a corporate organization update. So I will ask for a motion to rise without reporting, please. Moved by Councillor Chappelle, seconded by Councillor Boehm, that Council rise from the Committee of the Whole closed meeting without reporting. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, next on to the approval of the adeds, uh, we have one additional bylaw. Can I ask for a mover for the adeds, please? Moved by Deputy Mayor Kiley, seconded by Councillor Osanek. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, we have no presentations this evening. We do have a couple of delegations. So we will first invite Dr. Kieran Moore, Medical Officer of Health for KFLNA Public Health, to appear before council to speak to information report number one with respect to the City of Kingston's radon strategy. And just a reminder to our delegations that you have five minutes. We'll just wait to the try it. Mr. Mayor, City Councilors, uh, community members, thanks very much for the opportunity uh, to present to you today on a study that we did within KFLA on the exposure of our community to, to radon. I'm going to give a brief background on what radon is. So radon is a naturally occurring radio radioactive gas resulting from the breakdown of uranium. It's colorless, odorless, tasteless, and it accumulates within uh, some of our residences. It's the second leading cause of lung cancer in uh, Canada, and it's only behind smoking. There's a strong link between also smoking and radon, uh, that they're additive uh, as an exposure causing lung cancer. I think we all know about asbestos uh, and asbestos association with lung cancer. Radon causes 10 times as much lung cancer as asbestos is, isn't it? and is in a very important exposure in our community, given that it has such a strong association with lung cancer. In 2012, Health Canada did a study of the exposure of our community to radon, and it came to the conclusion that of the 99 homes that they tested within all of KFLNA, around 11.1% were above Health Canada's recommendation of exposure of 200 becquerels in a cubic meter of air. We wanted to know how accurate that small study was for our region and whether further action in our community should be taken. So I'm happy, pleased to report to you uh, the results of the testing that was done by KFLA in partnership with our municipal governments. We eventually tested 1,047 homes within KFLA, around 600 of which were in Kingston. And 21% of the homes tested were above Health Canada's recommendation of 200 becquerels per meters cube, significantly higher uh, than what's experienced across Ontario and Canada. And when we look at a more stringent guideline like the WHO, the World Health Organization recommends of 100 becquerels per meters cubed, around half the homes within our region had a higher level. This puts our community at risk for lung cancer. Spatially, uh, I've, we've drawn out maps of the Health Canada recommendation and the World Health Organization recommendation. And you can see it's across our region. We have higher levels of radon exposure in the homes that are tested. Uh, and, and there is some higher concentration of exposures in the South Frontenac area. But I would say all of our region is at an increased risk of radon exposure, hence putting our community at risk for lung cancer. 
As a result of our testing, we shared that information um, with uh, the, the city and in particular with your chief building officers uh, of our region. And I want to commend Lisa Kapner Hunt uh, and her team uh, in the manager of building services group uh, that have created a, a radon mitigation strategy. So a strategy to reduce the risk of lung cancer in our community. Within KFLA at present, we have around 100 diagnosed cases of cancer, lung cancer per year. This is the number one leading cause of death from cancer in our community. And around 16 of those 100 could be reduced if we can bring radon to a lower level. There's no safe level of radon in our homes. Uh, and, and so, uh, the chief building officer has come up with a mitigation strategy. It is preventable, the exposure to radon. We can construct our homes differently to protect uh, our family members being exposed to uh, radon, and that plan has been shared with this council. So you can put in uh, pressurization systems under the concrete floors to move the gases away from entering the home, or you can put impermeable membranes uh, along the concrete home uh, to prevent the gases from seeping in. And uh, these strategies have been put in play, I believe, for September. Uh, and over time, we should see a reduction in lung cancer rates within our region as a result of this forward-thinking, proactive prevention strategy. So my goal today was to share with you the results of our testing, to commend uh, the city for taking action to mitigating the risk of lung cancer, and to encourage further testing of all members of our community for the houses that currently exist. KFLA will be uh, providing uh, radon testing kits at a reduced cost of around $20 per kit starting in November this year, uh, and we'll try to uh, provide as many kits as community members uh, will take up uh, as long as uh, we can afford it. So I can stop there and take questions from council. Great, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Deputy Mayor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. In your research, was there exploration of other municipalities that might have similar levels of radon? And if so, what they've done to address it? So uh, thank you very much through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there have been other communities that have tested uh, for radon, including Windsor and Thunder Bay regions, uh, and, and many of them are adopting mitigation strategies. The Ontario Building Code recommends that you can take this up, but there's only been a few uh, municipalities that have taken up this new mitigation strategy to reduce communities' exposure. So again, a, a reason I wanted to present on behalf of our agency to commend uh, the city for taking these mitigation uh, strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ostroff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and thanks for your presentation. Did you say the mitigation factors for existing homes is, uh, was the air exchange, or what did you say? So very, very good point. I want to be clear. These are uh, the strategies that have been put in place are for new homes yeah. that will be developed uh, and approved after uh, September 1st. Uh, for existing homes, we recommend at KFLA that the home gets tested and that if your levels are above acceptable ranges, so above 200 becquerels per meter cubed, you would seek out an expert, uh, radon uh, expert, that could help you reduce the exposure of, of your family uh, to radon. Thank you. Councillor Senek. Thank you, Your Worship, and thanks so much for this information. So what brought on this study? Um, so we know that Health Canada did an initial study several years ago. Did we start to see high rates of cancer, of lung cancer in Kingston, or was it um, complaints that, oh, radon's really high in my home, and you started to see that as people were initiating their own radon tests? What brought on this study? So through you, Mr. Mayor, um, we had multiple presentations to us at the health unit regarding uh, concerns of uh, community members as well as builders and those that have been tasked with remediating homes. I actually tested my own home, which is relatively new, and found that my levels were exceptionally high. Uh, and, and as well, uh, the standards by which public health must work said that we should address radon. It was the first time it was put in our regulation that we must, at a local level, will address it, uh, and hence the reason we invested uh, to test further our community exposure to this known cancer-causing agent. 
Thank you. And just a follow-up question. Is there going to be a follow-up study in maybe five years or what will happen? Like I know it said in the report that people should take their own initiative to, you know, implement the mitigation measures and then get it retested. But would there be an overall study like you just done, have just completed in, um, you know, five years' time or so? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I think that's a gr great suggestion. Uh, as you know, public health is being restructured uh, and our responsibilities for radon may be taken away from us, so I can't make any commitment. Um, we also are studying knowledge, attitude, and beliefs of members of our community uh, regarding radon so that we can increase the awareness of it because we know not many people are aware that it's a known cancer-causing agent that, and there are prevention strategies for it. Uh, I will take away your suggestion uh, to our board uh, and, and strongly suggest that we have an ongoing communication and education strategy with our public. Uh, thank you. Councillor Chappelle. Thank you, through you, Your Worship. Listening to your presentation and reading your, your, your remarks, and I was wondering if this is something, radon testing, if it's something that uh, perhaps prospective home buyers should have in their contracts when they uh, sign a real estate agreement. For you, Mr. Mayor, I think that's a, a wonderful suggestion. Um, there may be some resistance because uh, uh, there is a cost to remediating. I think the, the, the most cost-effective means is preventing radon exposure in new homes. Uh, but it's, it's not an overwhelming cost to make sure that that home is safe. You, I think uh, we don't allow people to go into homes that have active asbestos when there's 10 times higher cancer rate from radon. Why we shouldn't be mandating homes to get tested uh, uh, is a question I think we should be addressing again uh, at a provincial level. Councillor Hill. Thank you. So you did, uh, were our schools and uh, other institutions included in the testing as well? So thank, thank you very much, that's a great question. We have worked very closely with our school board and we've started a study to look at all daycare settings. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm I would be happy to report back to council on our study of the daycare settings. Um, we have some comfort to know that the ventilation systems in schools and daycare settings, because the doors are constantly opening and closing, ha have reduced levels. And our initial evaluation of the data shows that the, their, their levels are safer than uh, domestic homes. Uh, purely because of that reason. Uh, but I'm happy uh, to, to bring back to Council our final report on the, uh, the daycare settings, uh, which should be available fairly soon. Thank you. Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Dr. Moore, for a very informative report. Um, I'd like to focus on one element of the report, where because you've been speaking about um, private dwellings or single-family dwellings. And it says in here that the code doesn't have outline, uh, guideline, doesn't outline guidelines for multi-residential, and uh, also commercial and institutional. But for those Kingstonians living in multi-residential, uh, can they get a radon testing kit? And if so, what would they do if they found uh, high levels? Uh, uh, so if the question is specifically about a landlord-tenant relationship, uh, if the levels are high uh, in, in a uh, tenant uh, being exposed to radon um, and, they, and they did a self-testing or got the test through us, we could, uh, it, depending on how high the level is, advocate on behalf of those individuals for increase uh, in radon reduction strategies. As, as simple as turning on the furnace fan to increase the ventilation in, in, a, in an apartment dwelling or building uh, can reduce levels. It doesn't have to be a very expensive uh, remediation strategy. So, so if the testing is high and, and it's a landlord tenant, building uh, inspector could be involved or local public health. And a related question for those residents in um, in the multi-residential apartment buildings, but also would apply to institutional or commercial spaces. Uh, we've just we've passed a recent motion about air conditioning and keeping your doors closed, which makes sense if you're trying to keep the air cool from air conditioning and reduce energy use. Is there any evidence in the studies showing that open windows reduces radon exposure? Absolutely. Any means of uh, increasing fresh air into the home, whether it's uh, mechanical uh, air exchange, heat exchange units, um, will reduce your levels. And it could be as remediation can be as simple as that uh, action. Councillor Holland. Thank you. And, and 
Sorry, just one thing I think to clarify about the 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 type of gas it, it settles, correct? Like it would be it, so it's more like it's more prominent in basement or lower level units. Correct. So yep. that's a very good point. It, very, it would be highly unusual in an apartment building uh, to to have a high level of uh, radon. It typically does settle and it is a higher exposure in the lower uh, first and second floors of buildings. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to our next delegation, Roger Healy will appear before council to speak to clause one of report number 71 from the Environment, Infrastructure and Transportation Policies Committee with respect to the City of Kingston Road Safety Plan Vision Zero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council, members of the community. Um, I'm here to talk tonight about uh, the Vision Zero uh, that will be coming up later on in your meeting. Um, I'm, I represent uh, Kingston Coalition for Active Transportation. We've been um, working on this. I've been on it for 10 years. So uh, we're working with the city and, and uh, health unit and, and uh, schools and Queens to try to, try to influence um, um, better road design and uh, and more active transportation and cities moving along very nicely on that. Um, the three things that I'd like to that I think we we should focus on and we'd like you to focus on uh, to achieve Vision Zero is to prioritize the speed reduction and uh, secondly design roads for lower speeds and I think uh, we have plenty of examples of that. And, and the third thing that may seem counterintuitive is, is it, it actually improves traffic flow. Uh, here we have a picture of a famous uh, Dutch uh, roundabout. And it's, it's different from typical North American roundabout because it's, it segregates all road users. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the, uh, oops. This thing seems to be, oh, sorry. Okay, I don't know if these slides are in the same order I'm used to, but anyway. Um, the Netherlands uh, happens to be uh, one, of the, one of the places with the happiest road drivers, actually. The road users of all these uh, countries uh, rated by an app called Waze which uh, tries to uh, rate road driving. And yet, and also the Netherlands has uh, the, one of the highest, probably it is the highest uh, active transportation. Uh, these are bicycle uses only. And when you add walking and uh, other forms of active transportation, they're over 50% in the Netherlands. And uh, I think we can learn a lot from that. You notice Canada way down here in the U.S. down at 1% bicycling. Uh, the thing that moved um, the Netherlands, the Netherlands didn't, wasn't always uh, a, a haven for bicycles. If you look along the, this is starting from post-war 1950 on the lower axis. Uh, they had, a, like everyone else in Europe, a very high car culture and started adopting that. And they, they had terrific road deaths, uh, leading to 3,500 road deaths per year. And, uh, um, but they, they had a, a big re revolt in the Netherlands and said, we've got to do better. And so you see where they are now. In 2010, they're down to 500. So they went from 3,500 to 500. Um, we've, we've had some examples of, of how road design can, can happen, and, and it, it actually happened accidentally. I live on the corner of Beverly. I live further up Beverly Street, but at Beverly and King, when the park was improved at, at Breakwater Park, it became a, a crisis zone for pedestrians darting across, and there's no, no stop, uh, but the, the city immediately put up these... Uh, paddles that force people to slow down and it worked quite quite effectively as a as a stopgap measure and now there's a pedestrian crossing there 
But the main things we have to deal with are uh, horizontal deflection, vertical deflection, narrower lanes, textured road surfaces, and peripheral features like bollards. So there's some examples of that, uh, bollards, uh, textured surfaces, much like you have around Market Square here. They're, they're actually beautiful and they're effective. Narrower lanes, raised intersections, so it's like a, a table, it sort of warns drivers, and then of course our roundabouts. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, the, the, so designing the road, it's in the preamble of the document, uh, we design the roads to protect road users. And it's not enough to just change the, the speed limit. The speed limit itself will be ignored if, if the road allows people to speed. And there, unfortunately, is the gruesome probability of death by collision. If you look at anything over 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers an hour, you have a very high likelihood of becoming uh, a statistic. Thank you very much. That's it. Are there Thank any you. questions from Council? Uh, Councillor Strub. Yes, so, and I remember um, at committee, uh, there was also a couple delegations to, uh, to this effect. Um, you've been working with staff through your advocacy on uh, this uh, active transportation document and now the implementation plan. And I was wondering, uh, if you could just identify one or two areas that you think um, maybe we need to prioritize as we roll out this Im implementation plan, especially ones that maybe aren't clearly spelled out in the current document. Uh, well, um, the, the whole notion of separation of the vulnerable users from the, the high traffic areas and the high speed areas, and again, I, I keep referring to speed reduction, but um, that's, that's in the active transportation implementation plan, which you'll deal with later. Uh, but uh, I think that's one of the keys. And then the other, the other th element of that plan, which maybe gets overlooked a little bit, is the, is the whole neighborhood uh, focus. Um, if neighborhoods get engaged in, in finding out how they best get around their neighborhood, uh, they can tell city staff what needs to change. And it's not, and, and I think a lot of it will come down to speed reduction in a way, but, uh, but as I've said, with de proper design, you can, you can approach some of that speed reduction will actually improve traffic flow. Councilor Doherty. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. Um, now, Sir John A. Macdonald would be the perfect example of a, of a road where lowering the speed limit isn't, uh, isn't enough, but I wonder if you could expand on that comment. Uh, yeah. Um, well, as we know, maybe in the last year and a half, uh, some road signs were put up, a flashing yellow, telling you your current speed, and it was always above... The, the now prescribed feed at speed of 50 kilometers per hour. Um, and, but the unfortunate side, uh, the real problem is that Sir John A was designed like a miniature 401. And uh, you, you know, as a driver, you just want to go fast on that road. And so you don't have cues that tell you to slow down. Um, and, and the unfortunate part of that is that when you design a, an internal city road like a miniature 401, it, it, it serves as a barrier for people crossing the neighborhoods and, uh, and also people don't ride bicycles on that road very much. So, um, so some, of the, uh, some of the current, the active transportation implementation plan that's before, will be before you soon, doesn't deal much with Sir John A. Macdonald Boulevard right now, but eventually it will. And it will be, I think, a key component in that neighborhood. Uh, your district and, and the Williamsville and, and, uh, and just above that around, around the Kingston Shopping Center. I think those are areas that are crucial for, uh, there's a lot of schools there, a lot of, a lot of people moving back and forth to Queens, as you know, and uh, and St. Lawrence College. So uh, they're they're highly uh, used areas, but 
Sir John A. Macdonald is, a, is really a barrier in a lot of ways. Uh, Councillor Neal. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, quick question regarding one-way streets. Uh, the two streets in my district, and one of them is shared with Councillor Stroud's district, are one-way streets, Brock and Johnson, and they seem to be speedways. I know under new urbanism and uh, street smart uh, and other, um, they've addressed the issue of one-way streets, multi-lane one-way streets, and discouraged them. Um, do you have any comments or reflection on, on that issue? Um, that's a tough one. When I first moved to Kingston, Queen Street was a one-way street, and uh, it was converted to two-way, and I think I still find myself, <laughs> even after 25 years or whatever, 30 years, you know, not being sure. Um, so it's a very tough thing to, to try to change that. That's for sure. I, I know that personally. But... but uh, with the new uh, bollards that have been put on on Johnson and Brock, um, they've had a dramatic effect, and I've, I've had people tell me a lot that it, they've really noticed a slowdown of traffic. So it's it's had a it has had an effect of of slowing traffic down for sure, and uh, and it's made cyclists I think feel a lot more comfortable because of, not just because of the reduced speeds but because their lane is more delineated. So uh, it, you know when it comes to if you wanted to switch Johnson and Brock to two way, uh, I think you'd, you'd have a you'd have a lot of uh, a lot of people uh, wondering about that, but. But it, it could be done, and it would be an interesting experiment. Councillor Ostroff. Very diplomatic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, I know most of this is uh, urban focused. Uh, have you had successful ideas in, in the rural areas? And um, some of our thoughts and uh, questions are for paved, more paved shoulders to give the bikes uh, more room, and uh, also walking, uh, you know, families and uh, just just that alternate tra transportation or modes of, of of moving around. And and that's one question. And the second one related to: Do you see success stories uh, for us to consider in in the plan as well, but for roundabouts? Uh, well, I'll deal with the roundabouts one right away uh, because there are some new ones being added to Centennial. They're, they're right now in place uh, along the Centennial Extension. And you might want to, when, when that road opens up, you might want to check them out and just you see that they're actually pretty well designed and, and I think they'll be quite successful. Um, getting back to the question about rural areas, um, Paved shoulders for sure are very important, especially for people walking dogs and you know kids walking to school and stuff. And uh, I think the minimum you have to do is pave the shoulders. But um, uh, as far as uh, um, other issues with the rural areas, um, uh, the, the, I think the questions really become, uh, you know, who's who's using it. So you really should th talk about separated pathways. You know, the, the KNP trail is wonderful out there and, uh, and you'll see a lot of people using that and that becomes their focus for dog walking and family activities. So uh, focus more on off-road trails for, for now because the space is there. Um, but uh, I think ideally if we had to redesign a city, we would have more trails through the city. So. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Okay, so we have no further delegations this evening. We have no briefings. Are there any petitions to present? Seeing none, we have no motions of congratulations, recognition, sympathy, condolences, and speedy recovery. We do have one deferred motion, but with the consent of council, I'm going to move that until after report number 65, because there is an item in report 65 which may um, render this motion moot. Okay, so given that consent, we will move immediately to report number 65 from the CAO.
Moved by Councillor Hill, seconded by Councillor Osanek, that report number 65 from the CAO consent be received and adopted. So there are 10 clauses. Would anyone like any of the clauses separated? Councillor Stroud. Number five, number six, and number seven, please. Okay, seeing no other separations, we will first vote on the balance of the items. Number one, proposed renaming of a private road known as Entel Lane to Demer Avenue. Proposed naming of a new road to be constructed from Taylor Kidd Boulevard as Demer Avenue. Number two, permanently close a portion of unopened road allowance at 1422 Woodbine Road. Number three, professional engineering services for stormwater system improvements on King Street East, Place d'Armes to Anglin Bay. Number four, award of contract supply of winter sand. Number eight, Kingston Penitentiary Tours 2020. Number nine, Provincial Audit and Accountability Fund Transfer Payment Agreement. And number 10, Kingston Community Brand Position Campaign. We will call the vote, please. And that carries. Okay, item number five. Award of contract, provision, and cleaning of floor mats. Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. I had the opportunity to speak to staff about this today uh, to ask a couple of questions that arise from uh, my reading of the report, and I'm sure uh, residents might have had the same questions, so I'll just ask one or two questions of uh, staff. I was satisfied with the answers, and, and maybe staff could answer them here, and uh, that would also answer the question for whatever residents might wonder about this. So we've got the provision, so the cleaning of floor mats, we've got the request to go to a company, an external company called Sintas, uh, for an annual cost of 24000 to essentially swap out the mats, uh, clean ones for dirty ones, and uh, that service uh, comes at a cost of $2,000 a month for the municipality. So my question is, um, that cost, how does it compare to what we must have done before, uh, which is have city staff, city uh, cleaning staff, wash the rugs or the floor mats themselves? Mr. Uh, Knells. Uh, three, Your Worship. In um, facilities management construction services in our area, uh, staff, um, internal custodian staff, and contracted uh, custodial staff, uh, they clean the mats um, on a daily schedule, so they vacuum them, mop them. Uh, the mats that we change out is um, more seasonal affected, so in the winter months um, they're taken out and cleaned, um, and clean mats are replaced. Uh, we don't have the staffing uh, resources to, or the equipment right now, or in the past, to clean these mats. So essentially what you're saying is if we didn't, if we wanted to keep this in-house, this service, which would be, if passed, provided by a professional company that specializes in this kind of service, if we did it ourselves with our own cleaning staff, we would have to hire more staff, and that cost would be significantly more than $24,000 a year? Uh, my understanding in our area, our specific area right now, we do not have the resources or the equipment uh, to clean the staff, uh, sorry, to clean uh, the mats that we have in our facilities. And there's uh, mats in facilities across uh, the corporation too. Okay, so is it fair to say that this is actually the cheapest option on the table right now for this service? Um, for what we've seen in our facilities, uh, yes. Thank you. Okay, so we will call the vote on Clause 5. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, Clause 6, Award of Contract, British Wig Building Roof Replacement. Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. This is a, I have similar questions on this re regarding cost and rationale, but it's a larger budget item, so I guess um, well, hopefully we'll uh, get some more answers. It, I believe it's also Facilities Department. So. I read the report. Um, there's ongoing uh, leaking in the roof of the British Wig Building, that and uh, all attempts to mitigate have not provided a leak-free roof. That's what it says in the report. 
including removal of the rooftop uh, garden and patio and other attempts to fix the leaks. And so now the recommendation is to replace the entire roof uh, at significant cost. So my first question is, did uh, city engineering staff examine the facility and give us an opinion? Mr. Ellis? Uh, uh, yes, various consultants and contractors have looked at the roof since uh, well before 2014. Uh, one of the main causes is when the rooftop garden uh, was installed uh, previously. Um, a lot of um, penetrations happened in the roof and it's gone to the point that the membrane underneath um, is soaked in the insulation and uh, even though sections were replaced a few years ago, um, this was uh, the best and only option right now that we have to stop these leaks. Thank you, so I, I assume the consultant um, that recommended roof replacement is not necessarily the same as the contractor that would do the replacement, is that correct? Uh, correct. And, um, and it's not possible to simply replace the membrane without replacing the entire roof? Um, correct, a lot of thought and work has been put into this over the last six, seven years, but um, uh, just how the construction occurred many years ago, uh, prior to the city owning the facility, um, there's a lot of leaks from skylights to um, where rooftop units are and the curbing and even the units themselves to the actual membrane itself uh, to even how the flashing was installed. Um, there's a lot of challenges with the roof. Okay, my final question has to do with the timing and uh, budgetary implications of the cost. So it, it sounds, the rationale sounds uh, uh, fair to me uh, that replacement may well be our only option, and that is the cost, so that's not a dispute. The question would be if this was not foreseeable um, for the budget year and why it was not included in the budget uh, uh, amounts for, uh, for facilities. Uh, it was included in the budget, but the cost came back as more investigation occurred uh, that there were significant uh, challenges with the roof. And also, we're looking at replacing all the insulation and increasing the amount of insulation to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we're putting back a membrane uh, that will be um, able to take a rooftop garden in the future if one is installed uh, back again. But, but the installation is not included in this price of the rooftop garden. So if I understand your, your answer, the, it was in the budget, but the exact amount of the work was unknown, and that's why we have this in front of us today? Correct. At the time, uh, this has been going on for a few years, and uh, the final work that was done uh, recommended the total replacement, and that's why we um, uh, proceeded with the total replacement. No, no further questions, thank you. Okay, so we will call the vote on clause six. Please vote. And that carries. Clause seven, single source purchase Microsoft Office 365 subscription licenses. Councillor Strapp. So uh, this one is again a significant cost. It's a different department. Um, I guess some of the uh, some of the report is fairly straightforward and easy to understand. I mean, this is a uh, software suite that all city staff would have access to. It's a subscription through Microsoft. It is up to, up to date, cutting edge uh, software. I'm assuming the uh, annual cost, though. It, after this year is over 200,000 a year and it's a five year contract making this agreement worth almost a million dollars. And the question is, it's a sole sourced RFP. There's, there was no other quotes. So my question is, why did we not seek a competitor's price for a similar product? Mr. Bumstead. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the, uh, one of the realities of the Microsoft Office suite is it's so inherent in business and in usage that there aren't really a lot of competitors. There are some, there's Google Docs, there are some other 
versions out there. But when we assess the capabilities of those, as well as the amount of integrations that other systems in the city are using with email, with other opportunities, the, the cost of, of the city to switch out to a, a competitive product is really, uh, would be much more than what this cost is. I feared that would be the answer. Uh, so if I could uh, offer my opinion on this, we are behind the eight ball on this item because this is a monopoly. Uh, Microsoft, they're worldwide, and they've got us where they want us. They've got us forced to enter into a contract with them. It sort of reminds me of what happens with some telecommunications companies. Uh, when you've got a monopoly, you can, you can ask your own price, and... Uh, and you're going to get it. And that's what we're seeing here, despite the fact that we have a procurement bylaw that requires a competitive process. It sounds like the answer I just received tells us that's not possible. So Microsoft's business practice is incompatible with our procurement bylaw. And to the point of whether city staff could function without renewing the subscription or obtaining the subscription, I guess that's debatable because I do not have a current subscription of Microsoft. I have the one I bought with my computer. It's obviously out of date now, but I still use it. It still works. And I don't understand why the city can't do the same uh, or get a, a cheaper version. So even though I believe the answer was given by the information officer, I'm gonna be vote voting against this million dollar purchase uh, on principle that I do not want to support a monopoly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll call the vote on Clause 7, please. Please vote. And that carries by a vote of 10 to 3. Okay, so just a note that our deferred motion is now moot, and so it's effectively been uh, ruled out of order. So we will move on to report number 66 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that report number 66 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. Okay, so the first clause is the Canada Ontario Community Housing Initiative and Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative. Call the vote, please. And that carries. Number two, council priority for the development of affordable housing. Councillor Chappelle. Yes, you, Mr. Chair. I recall when this uh, discussion of affordable housing had come up in strategic planning, as well as when we allotted $18 million towards our budget with respect to the development of potential partnerships for affordable housing. And the question I asked, if this opportunity would also be presented to the private sector because $18 million is a lot of money. And my in under interpretation of the $18 million is that it would be coupled with some sort of leveraged program with the federal or provincial government. So my question to the CAO then is, why are there no representations from the private sector for this opportunity if we are to uh, proceed with affordable housing at 316 and 318 Princess Street? Interim CAO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through Mr. Mayor. So um, a couple of things. One is uh, in, uh, in conversation and during the development of the strategic plan, the conversation with uh, council was very much about 90 affordable units and looking at some form of sustainability of those units. Um, there's nothing preventing us from working with the private sector, but typically the private sector looks for um, time frame that are not necessarily permanent or sustainable in the long term. Uh, they are usually looking for 20 years or less in terms of guarantee for affordable housing. Having said that, there's nothing preventing us from working with the private sector. It would probably not be in the same um, at the same level of funding as what we would look for uh, providing to non-for-profit 
because of the time frame, the period of affordability, and it could most likely be on another site. So the report does identify that the city will work with partners, not just on 1316 Princess Street, but also other properties, um, including uh, non-for-profit, uh, potentially properties. So it's not only limited to, to this uh, parcel of land. Just for clarification, there was, an, was there any discussion with private sector potential partners for the development of this site? Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, not for this site. There has been a conversation with a private sector that is interested in building affordable housing on another site, um, and uh, we will have further discussion with that uh, private sector uh, developer. Okay, next time, this is Councillor Neal. Thank you, and I did share some questions with staff earlier today, um, but I just want to uh, get some of this on the public record, if I might. Um, what will be the net additional affordable units anticipated on this site uh, for the, uh, potentially for the $18 million? Interim CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm going to separate the two. The 18 million, what Council directed us to do was to look at 90 units, um, and I would assume that's a minimum. Um, so those would be additional new units that would be created. Those units don't necessarily all have to be located on 1316 Princess, and that, that was part of, of, I think, the content of the report indicating that we are going to be working with partners, including non-for-profit, that may have other properties where they may be interested in building affordable housing. So the number was the one that council directed us to achieve and the properties themselves i mean would include 1316 princess street but not necessarily be limited to that property thank you um so we really don't yet have a handle or a clear idea do we on what the anticipated cost per unit for affordable housing might be or do we have a certain target uh in mind Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So based on, and this is just looking at what Kingston Frontenac Housing Corporation built in the last um, few years, I think the, um, the range was between 160 to, to 200 based on uh, the size of the unit. So it varied, um, and it could be also uh, depending on the site. So that's what we would assume in terms of costs, and those would be the dollars we would probably consider and contemplate for permanent affordable housing, meaning if it's an organization that's going to provide um, those units on a permanent basis. Um, of course, all of that would have to be reported back to council and approved by council in terms of the funding allocation and agreements. You anticipated my next question. I appreciate that uh, all of this will come back to council. Um, I guess my primary concern, um, we've purchased this property, oh, a decade ago, almost. And I know that there are issues with the property. Uh, and I'm just concerned that we aren't kind of anchored to this developing this property kind of at all costs because we now own it and I'm I'm I don't know if that makes sense but if you could address that those concerns I mean at some point in time when we do our due diligence if the cost per unit given what might be remediation and other costs attributed to this site, I think I'd, I'd be reassured if we uh, have a step back option within this. 
Thank you, through Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll start, and, and Mr. Eugen Boss uh, can definitely add in terms of the property itself because his team worked on the acquisition and the record of site condition, actually. So there's been a lot of work done on the property. I'm assuming, Councillor, that you might be referring to some very high-level estimates that have been floating around without a whole lot of necessarily background information connected to them. Um, so we, we have... Um, we are currently working uh, through that, but we have been doing uh, due diligence as part of the process. Okay, Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a couple of questions. I had, I had a chance to speak, uh, have a really good conversation with Mr. Laidman on, on this, so I, um, I was happy to learn a few things. And I, I just think that some of these things, the, the, the citizens will wanna hear too. And so I'm gonna ask you a few questions to that effect. First of all, so the, on the, on the, uh, this, the basic strategy here, I mean, it's clear to us, we've, we talked about it before in strategic planning, we've seen the report and everything, but for those who are just tuning in, the basic strategy here is the city's acquired land is going to develop it and with the help of uh, these non-profit, non-for-profit partners, uh, get as many affordable units as we can in this, in this space, which, uh, the preliminary work uh, indicates 164 units total are possible on the site. So that is a known number. Uh, one of the unknown, some of the unknowns and the need for further reporting is around uh, how, what is feasible with the not-for-profit model, which types of uh, affordable units, RGI versus uh, percentage of market rent and so on, uh, different types of affordable. And there's at least three types that I discussed today with Mr. Laidman. Um, so maybe we could get a, a rundown on that, uh, just so that we would know what we're looking, what numbers we're going to receive in the future, so we have, we're, we're more comfortable supporting this. And then the um, the 90 added units. So the 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 council direction uh, with the at, at strategic planning and with the budget motion were to add 90 units of affordable housing. And so the question would be. Um, if this uh, if this project isn't shown to be feasible to add the full 90 units, uh, what else can we do to get to that number of 90 and what will that look like? And then the other question being re regarding the Rideau Heights units that are RGI units that are being moved here eventually, hopefully with the model. Um, whether that those units that are moving, what would happen to the old units? Are they being demolished or uh, transferred to some other type of housing stock? And then finally, as part of that first question, um, the various types of affordable. So there's RGI units, there's percentage of market rent, and I discussed two percentages today, 60 and 80. And then there's the portable funding model where um, where the subsidy is given to directly to the the applicant and may allow them to stay where they are with that subsidy that pays a portion of their rent and what how that compares financially with the build the new units model that we're looking at so I know it's a big question but maybe we can hit all the bases in one answer thank you Mr. Laban did you get all of those questions Okay, the floor is yours. Sure, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I think just starting from maybe the last question you answered, just to clarify, the portable housing benefit uh, item is is separate from this project. Uh, staff, there has been a pilot project ongoing for 2019 where we've been trying out a new model of instead of providing uh, subsidy to a, an organization or private landlords to provide subsidies directly to clients themselves to take into the private market to determine if that's a viable option to consider as we try to expand affordable housing in the city and the county. And we intend to have a report back to council in October um, describing the success of that um, and whether that should be continued or not. So that's just one component moving forward, but we wouldn't expect to have that on this particular property. Um, the types of units, certainly council's direction in the strategic planning uh, was that it should include a range of affordability. So the range of affordability, as Councillor Stroud has correctly identified, could range from moving RGI units to the site, 
the three providers that are proposed are all social housing providers. They would all be able to provide social housing in their units because we have existing agreements with them. Uh, the intent would be to move a number of affordable of RGI units from Rito Heights to accomplish the Rito Heights regeneration strategy to move 100 units, which were already in the 30 to 40 range already. Um, so. It would be a range of affordability from RGI to 80%. Um, part of the um, implementation plan that we've committed to by c in the recommendation is that that range of affordability would be nailed down as we worked with our partners to determine how many units could be feasibly provided at each type of affordability. And obviously that would include a financial analysis, pro forma analysis of the various development proposals to determine how much at various levels we can provide and make the units sustainable in the long term. I believe you had maybe one other question that I probably haven't answered yet. Yeah, so to clear, just to reassure us about um, the original motion that asked for 90 added units of affordable housing and if some are moving from Rideau Heights, then are we losing those units in, in, in Rideau Heights or what's happening? Because it's 90 added units, so net 90 added. So how does that all fit together? Sure, so through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, correct, it's, it's, it's understood by staff that it's a net 90 new units. Certainly those units that are moved from, from Rideau Heights we have already started to do it through the portable housing benefit program as well and have allowed KFHC to return them to what we would suitably call market. However, due to the nature of the market in those areas, they remain affordable at the 80% level still. So, they, so there will be a net 90 units provided. Um, and the, those units that are remaining in Rideau Heights, um, they'll be turned over to market, but realistically, they'll still be at the 80% affordable rent unit level. Okay, so you you seem to just say that you're, you seem confident that this project at this site, despite the fact that we don't know all the details of feasibility, should be able to support 90 new affordable units of various uh, types through the spectrum. Interim CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So the, the 90 units may not all be located at 1316 Princess Street. We have a partner, for example, that we're, we're trying to work with um, that actually owns other properties, and they're interested in building on some of their properties. So there may be a portion of the 90 that gets built on some other properties. So it doesn't mean that all the 90 will actually be at 1316 Princess. Okay, so with that answer, then am I correct in assuming, though, that when we get the next report, will, it'll be clearer where we will make up the rest of that 90 or where, what we can pursue to get the rest of that 90, hopefully by the end of this council term? Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, absolutely. And it will be before the end of the, well before the end of the council term. Hey, thank you very much for those detailed uh, responses. I would just say to my colleagues that obviously with the housing crisis and general affordability and everything and the national headlines that we're generating here in Kingston on this, uh, this is very, very important. Uh, and I don't need to tell you that. But because of this, I 30, think that the nuance that we've gone over today... 30 seconds. And the way that we're, we're getting more... What I like is the last clause. The last clause tells us that even though we don't have all the answers now, we will be getting them and we're moving towards more affordable housing stock. And for that reason, I will be supporting this, uh, these recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to be clear, but I think that was clear, but there's another way of looking at it. And that is the original proposal suggested 30 RGI, 30 affordable and 30 market. So in my understand that the 30 RGI will not necessarily be at 1316 Princess Street. It's sort of the flip side of the question that was previously asked, but I'm not sure the answer is uh, symmetrical. In, in, the, in the council's strategic priority thing, I'm not gonna quarrel about that, it says 90 
affordable units. And in fact, in a way, staff have actually improved the proposal, okay, let's be clear about this, by saying they're gonna make all the other ones affordable. What I'm concerned about is the fate of the 30 RGI units that was in the original proposal. Because that covers a whole section of the population and why it was in that, in the proposal. The market units that were called for in the original proposal were there to make sure that the RGI units were affordable, like from a, from a project point of view. So I'm just trying to figure out what's happen, happening, what the thinking is around the 30 RGI. Not necessarily saying I disagree, I just don't think the information is there. Interim CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, I just so happen to have Exhibit A of the strategic plan with me, and I do have the measurable listed here for this item, and it reads minimum of 90 affordable units ranging from RGI to 80% CMHC market rent within a 160 approximately housing unit development at 1316 Princess Street. Land use planning and development approvals agreement were in 2019-2020 and construction in 2020-22. So there's no specific reference in here in regards to 30 RGI. Now I know, Councillor Hutchison, that you did raise that point in discussion, but it wasn't specific in the, um, in the actual implementation plan. No, and I agree with that. What you just read, I agree, that's exactly what it says. The, the point is because, the point of the original proposal was because we have a housing crisis for say 80% of the population or potential population looking for a home of some sort, um, the proposal was a mark, 30 market, 30 affordable, and 30 RGI because I thought that would address all three sections of the fragmented market that we face and would allow for the, we would need those 30 RGI because the people at the bottom are the ones that are most acutely affected. So what I'm trying to find out is, in the thinking of staff, where did those 30 RGI units go? Are they gonna be there at all? And that's an issue if they're not there at all. So I'm, I'm just gonna jump in for a moment here. So I clearly remember talking about the 90 units and the range of affordability, but I do not recall that council directed the specific 30, 30, 30 split between. And, they, it, and we didn't. Okay. Okay, I agree with that, but I'm trying to relate that to the original concept that I put before council and how that would work and what would make it affordable across the board for different segments of the population. And so I'm concerned about the people at the bottom of the income level, okay? And that where those RGI units went or if we're going to do it. In terms of hurdle? Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So we will definitely include RGI. The number, I, I don't think we've finalized. I don't think we've finalized the overall number, either in terms of 60% market rent, et cetera. The thing that I would add as well um, for council is that from a staff perspective, we would never recommend financing market units. So if we take the 90 units as, as it was suggested and the 18 million, this means that we would be providing as a city $200,000 for a market unit, which from a staff perspective, we would not recommend that investment. We would instead utilize that money to create more affordable housing, whether those range from RGI to um, 280%. So the actual number and the breakdown hasn't yet been determined, but that's what would be reported back to council. Okay, so I just want to put that question about the 30 RGI on the table to be answered. Um, I agree that you should, the reason why the market rents were in there in the beginning was to help you finance the 30 RGI that were part of the original, okay? You, we understand that concept because KFHC does it. Now, their market rent is not what's going on in the market. So the old term used to be the economic rent. Okay, and so 
you know, average people could buy them. Otherwise, they couldn't back in mid-80s, okay? So I just wanted to say that. And if I've got a, a minute here, I just want to make a point about affordability and why not the private sector. And that is, we've done this for years. We put a certain amount of money into uh, private developments at about sometimes $50,000 a unit. And for that, they agreed to give us uh, or uh, give us some more affordable units or allow us to have RGI units in those buildings for sometimes 12, sometimes 15, or as this interim CAO said, 20 years. It's about as far out as you can get. The problem is after 20 years, those units lapse. They are no longer, and then as people move out, uh, they become full market, because there's no rent control on, after move out, right? So when you're comparing the price of what you're paying and what you're getting, you need to measure that model against the not-for-profit model, which is essentially you uh, put your investment in as, as a government, and you get it in per 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 perpetuity, like forever, or in more practical terms, 50, 60, 70 years. They're going to be affordable. They're permanent. Now, to the taxpayer, what does that mean? To the taxpayer, they paid that 50,000 or millions of dollars into those private de developments over time. They, they, they paid for that in their lifetime, and it lapses after 20 years. So if you live to be 80, you'll get to pay for the same amount of affordable housing four times in your life. So what's the better deal? Clearly, I've done the money, I've done the analysis. The better deal is the not-for-profit. Because you still got it at the end of 60 years, and hopefully 30, you've added to it. 30 seconds. And so it's important to look at the whole rollout to see what's more affordable to the taxpayer. I realize that's not the only thing we're looking at here. <laughs> we got a crisis. But it's, if you're talking about the spending money wisely, the not-for-profit route works better. And most developers don't want to do it because it doesn't maximize profit, obviously. Right? So thank, thank you. you. Okay, we will call the vote on clause two. Please vote. And that carries by a vote of 12 to 1. Report number 67 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Osterhoff, seconded by Councillor Chappelle, that report number 67 from the Chief Administrative Officer consider be received and adopted. Or so there's actually, the one, be, be received. Thank you. So there's the one item, 2019 Budget Update County of Frontenac Services. This is a consider report. So just to remind Council how to consider report works, there are three options that are before us. I will look to, council, to a councillor to move one of the options. We will then debate and discuss that option. If it passes, then we're done. If it fails, then there's an opportunity for a councillor to put forward another option until one of the options passes. Councillor Bohm. I'd like to put uh, option two on the floor. Okay, is there a seconder? Councillor Osanek. Okay, so option two is on the floor, and Councillor Bohm, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, uh, I know this has been a very difficult file. Um, it's, there's been numerous meetings over this. There's also a lot of public concern uh, that's come forward uh, about funding. Obviously, you see land ambulance in there as well, and uh, frame at home for the aged. And there's obviously big budget implications when we direct our outside agencies to come in at around 2.5%, and then you start having ones that are in at three or four times that. So it, it does create quite a lot of head scratching um, and basically trying to figure out how to make this all jive. Every single budget at the city right now and in, across the country is facing pressure. So this is something where, in my mind, looking at this option two provides a little bit of a compromise, meets part of the way, but at the same time speaks to the fact that we're all facing pressures. Um, and when you have kind of a landmark of two and a half percent and there are other ones that are coming in 
at many times that it's very hard to justify that to the taxpayer. So at the end of the day, this is something where it's a middle road. Uh, I'd like to thank staff for proposing it. Uh, and I'd ask, also like to ask the city treasurer, what are some of the implications here and are there some cost savings that can be found? And maybe if she could elaborate a little bit more on how the agreement with, uh, with the county actually works. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, to your worship. Um, so just just quickly in terms of, of how we've reached to this point, so the uh, council will recall when we were uh, in budget in January, uh, county council had not yet started their budget deliberations, so there was a, an estimate that we've included in the budget as an envelope for the County of Frontenac for both services. Um, we did have some preliminary numbers that had come from the county initially, and working with the county, um, we were able to, to get the projections down a bit, and we did that by a couple of things. One included in their original submission were some special one-time projects, uh, which, which we treated as like an increase in service. Um, and so we pulled those out, and based on some of my discussions with the county management, they felt that those still needed to go through county council and that there would be a good chance that those would not actually happen, particularly in a year where there was such challenges with just the basic level of service that they had. Um, the other thing that we had included at the time was... Uh, looking at some of their future projections, which obviously now are a bit up, uh, out of date and based on new information that we've got more recently from the province, but um, based on their projections, we saw that the land ambulance in particular was actually staying fairly flat in the subsequent year. And so we talked about a way that perhaps we could uh, phase in some of the increase over two years rather than taking it all in one year. So based on those, we put an estimate of about 5% overall in the budget. Um, because we had this and, and a couple of other smaller agencies that weren't quite finalized, um, we did include about another 150000 in contingency funds as well, knowing that these budgets still needed to be approved. So we had roughly about 6.5% in overall for the county, including that, uh, that $150,000. Um, the county did come and present, as you'll recall, at the budget deliberations, and they presented their base budget. They did not present at the time the special projects um, because those were definitely an unknown. Subsequent to that, when they actually uh, finished their budget deliberations and approved their budgets and sent us the, the new revised invoice, it did include the base budget plus the special projects plus about another $100,000 of additional things that had happened after our budget had been passed. Um, which got us up to the to the higher amount. So that's just a bit of the, the, the chronological events that happened that brought us to, to this point. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. So I think this is something where, I mean, definitely we're all facing different pressures. Um, this is a very difficult file. Um, I know you'll notice we have a number of paramedics in here who, who live and breathe this every day. So I think this is something where we want to be cognizant of the frontline services and, and the great work that they do. But at the same time, we have to find a way to be able to kind of do that with, within the, the realm of today. And, and that's that everybody's facing budget restrictions and tightening. So two is a little bit of a middle ground. And uh, so hopefully we can support that. And then we can all work together going forward in the future to try to make up that difference. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Neal. Thank you. And again, I had an opportunity to speak to staff. Uh, earlier, I just wanted to confirm with the treasurer, if I might, that in all of these options, but particularly option two, because that's what's on the floor, uh, the the amount of money that we are pledging towards land ambulance services that is allocated funding for land ambulance services. Is that correct? The count. The reason I'm asking is the county can't turn around and reprioritize any of that money and flow that money uh, to uh, to uh, the seniors' residents. Is that accurate, Ms. Kennedy? Thank you, through your worship. Yes, that's accurate. So council is actually setting this as two very separate services that they're setting the budget for, and they have to remain separate. Council has the ability to set based on, on what they feel is appropriate for each of them, but in terms of what we're funding to the county, it would have to be used for those two services specifically. And um, I didn't have 
uh, the opportunity uh, or the motivation, I guess, to go to the RULAC meeting. I'm just curious if I could direct a question to either staff or, or either of our members on that committee. Um, the amount that is now on the floor for option two, does that maintain urban uh, level of service uh, proposed? Does it increase it slightly uh, as the proposal in front of us from the county? Who would like, Ms. Kennedy? Thank you through your worship. So the proposal on the table uh, works out to about 7.5%, which, as Councillor Bowman said, is sort of a middle of the road. Um, in terms of dollar value, so we started with a, a variance of about um, $450,000. Um, of which, with the proposal on the table, the uh, city would be taking up about 250 of that, leaving about 200,000 short from what the county has approved as part of their budget. So there's about a $200,000 gap there um, that we would be looking to the county to, to figure out how to deal with. Thank you. Okay, next on my list is Councillor Osroff. Yeah, I just want to echo uh, what Councillor Bohm has said. I, I will also support option two. I think it is the best option, and I, I do want to thank staff for putting this together as well. And uh, for uh, it's a difficult file, and uh, even well, especially for me, probably trying to really grasp it all. But I, I, I think that we're really uh, finding the middle ground here, and uh, I commend staff for that. And I, I hope that. Uh, we can be at the table more uh, as a, as a RULAC members. Um, I think that's the part that um, uh, we feel, uh, Councillor Bowman, I, I, we'd like to be there uh, to be part of the discussion so that we there won't be these gaps. So, um, but uh, I hopefully that this can move forward this way. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. A question about option two. It says that the RULAC meeting happened on June 26, but in the report, uh, it mentions the commitment from the Provincial Minister of Health at the end of August at AMO to increase land ambulance transfers 4%. I'm wondering if that would alter the dollars that we see in this option. Ms. Kennedy. That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's been included, what the county's included in the revenue line item. Uh, I know they did include a percentage, whether it was 4% or not, I'm not sure in terms of that. Um, I know that the, the provincial funding for the land ambulance is always a year behind as well, so that's another challenge. So they would know what those numbers were. So my guess would be it wouldn't affect it, but, uh, but I stand to be corrected on that. Okay, so if it does, it will likely drop that amount there. Is that fair? Ms. Kennedy? Yes, through your worship. Yes, it, it could potentially drop the total amount that they've, the $10 million basically in total that they've put forward. Thank you. For that reason, I'll be inclined to support this. Okay, thank you. Next on my list is Councillor Hill. Thank you, your worship. The, uh, um have we had some uh, assurance from the uh, county that uh, if we approve option two that they won't take that to arbitration? So, so I will answer that one. So no, no, we don't have that assurance. And quite frankly, I think that it is definitely a possibility that we will end up at arbitration. So I guess my question then would be if that we're going to end up in arbitration in any event, or that seems like a likelihood. Uh, you know, we we have asked people to kind of show some some restraint. We worked with them in terms of establishing the budget priorities. You know, and here we are, kind of looking at a ten percent increase potentially, if the, you know if that's what the county is looking for ultimately in, in in terms of going to arbitration. So, you know, I guess I'm I'm I'm. Although I certainly understand the uh, the need to provide this service, and I want to see uh, our citizens, you know, adequately protected, and I certainly want to work in partnership with the county. 
I do take some exception to the letter that we received from the uh, from the uh, CAO today that sort of suggested that you know because of extra calls in the West End, you know that's the that's the cost center that's created the problem. Well, I suspect there's lots of different kinds of issues relative to cost centers throughout the county and and maybe throughout the city. So, I guess I I too would would probably be inclined to support option two, but I do it. Uh, 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 with some reluctance because of the way the process has worked this time. And I certainly hope that, uh, you know, in future, that uh, if someone's going to sort of step so far outside of the budget expectations that we've established for them, that they're at least going to come here and speak to council about that. You know, I, I'm disappointed not to see the uh, CAO here. I'm disappointed not to see the manager of uh, land ambulances here to, to speak to this issue. So. Uh, uh, I just feel a little bit like they feel like they got us over a barrel and, and they're just going to proceed. And I don't think that's evidence of a good working partnership in, the, in this regard, at least. So, although I will be supporting it, I will do it reluctantly. Thank you. Next time on my list is Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to know if I'm reading this correctly. Like the, um, there's a paragraph... Uh, indicating that the recommendation from RULAC couldn't even find a mover or a seconder at County Council. So if, if that's related to option two, um, I don't know where we're going here, right? I mean, it's like, um, I, I agree with almost all the comments that have been said, okay? So that's not the issue. Uh, but, I'm a little reluctant to support an option that is, can't even get on the table of the partner you're trying to communicate with. I'm also a little unclear, this is a question to staff, why, did, did the staff recommend, did I read they recommend option three? Um, and, and if so, what's the big advantage, or maybe there's no big advantage, but what's the advantage over option two? In terms say over from staff's point of view. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So, from a staff perspective, we're actually not recommend making a recommendation on this one. We're providing council with two options for consideration. I can tell you, though, that um, uh, unless council um, chooses to support option three, I think we would most likely end up in a process of mediation of some type. Um, the, keep in mind that the option three is something that we are also potentially likely to see again next year, meaning that um, based on prim preliminary discussions um, with county staff, they have indicated that they anticipate the increases to be the same next year and that there's really not much that they can do to change that at this point. So in, in this situation, it would mean that we would be um, having this conversation again next year, even most likely if we selected or council selected option three. Okay, um, so I guess that's a decision council. Some, some councilors indicated option two, I understand that. Not sure that it actually gets us anywhere, then, but I, I have objections to council to option three. Although it looks like all the options get us to the same place, and my main objection to option three is, or, or just the process as it works, it's no kind of budgeting when you're rating your reserve funds to pay for something that's an operating expense. That's just not good practice. I know in this case it's not the fault of the city. We asked, we didn't get it. We didn't get the information in time. Um, and also the idea that we would have a special levy to, to cover this. Personally, from my person, personal point of view, we're gonna have problems with what the province is doing. We may have a special levy for that so that we can show people it wasn't our doing, this was downloaded on us. I think we, in my opinion, we should reserve that for that, that provincial potential outfall. So I hope, hope somebody can clear up this logjam because I don't really know. 
I, I think I, my main concern coming here was will we have mediation? That's my next question. Will we have mediation before we have arbitration? Mr. McLeod. Through your worship, yes. That's the process within the uh, uh, various agreements in the restructuring order. That would be the expectation. Okay, so it's purely of two parties with two different interpretations of the agreement, right? And the agreement, it seems to be pretty general. And so I suppose in some, with attendant agreements over the years. So maybe that's, I don't know if that's avoidable, but that's probably part of the problem. So I, th I personally think it should go to mediation and necessary to arbitration and which option we vote for probably makes some difference, but not enough to matter in this case because because of the letter that we got indicates that just not looking at it the same way at all. I object, I just want to say, somebody in council would say that we, the county is subsidizing us. We're paying 79% of the cost of, uh, of um, the land ambulance and the, you have to have a system to make that work because we've talked about the communications and all that. I suppose we could suggest that the county go and ask the province to break the agreement. They can supply the land I'm on, so we'll supply ours. Somehow I don't think they're going to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Next on my list is Councillor McLaren. Thank you. Can, you uh, can we get confirmation from what it said in that letter that uh, we are, in fact, having more calls for service in Kingston relative to our proportion of payment? Is that correct? Like, do we have any evidence to, that that is, in fact, the case? Uh, Ms. Kennedy? Through your worship, uh, no, we don't have any of those numbers, so that was just information that was provided from the county in the letter. Um, we don't have any backup data in terms of being able to confirm that at this point. Okay. Um, just for the sake of this argument, let's say it is true, and they provide that at a later date. Um, it does strike me then that um, they are subsidizing us and not we subsidizing them in any way. May I ask that if we, my preferred option is three, just to be clear. Between option number two and number three, are the proportions that we pay and the proportions that they pay constant? Like, they're not stiffing us for any extra charges as a result of having more calls for service within our jurisdiction? Ms. Kennedy? Through your worship, yes, that's correct. So the proportions are staying the same. The, the land ambulance is based on a weighted assessment, of uh, which we're paying about just under 80%, but 78%. Um, and the Fairmount Home for the Aged is based on a negotiated percentage, and it's a flat 68%. So those have not changed at all. It's just the amount of the actual levy that, that they're requesting. Okay. So if we make this, say we take option two or option three, they will adjust their budget to compensate to keep the same percentage payments pain, tax pain essentially, is that correct? Ms. Kennedy? Through your worship. So again, going back to the previous question, they have to be kept <coughs> separate as separate services. So they don't have the ability to, to move those amounts between the two services. They would be kept separate. How they're gonna deal with it, I don't know what they would do at their end, um, but they do have to keep them as two very separate services. So in either case, option two or three, we're essentially forcing them to up their portion as well. Ms. Kennedy? Through your worship, um, that's one way that they could deal with it would be to take, so there's about there's a $200,000 difference there between two and three. Um, so they could choose just to fund that themselves. They could also look at where they could find some cost savings. Um, if there is additional revenues coming from the provincial announcement, and I, I was able just to, to uh, confirm that they have an increase in their revenue of about 2.5% is showing in their approved budget. Now, I would say it would be probably closer to three point something because that was a, it would be a nine-month 
that the, the province has confirmed it would be starting April 1st of 2019. Um, so there might be something there. So again, that would be another solution for them in terms of finding it. So there are different alternatives of what they might be able to do in terms of making it all balanced at the end of the day. And um, next question, do we have any idea from the perspective of a patient calling an ambulance? Um, what would be the difference between option two and three? Would it be like a 20 minute wait? Would it be an extra mortality per year? Do we know um, what the cost is in human health? So uh, I'm gonna take a, a stab at that one, Councillor McLaren. Um, and I will have some comments on this when it's my turn, but I think I'll, I'll just jump in. So in the discussion in the RULAC meeting with the county, <laughs> what's been very clear is that the funding commitment has already been made. So this is not a discussion on whether we're going to adjust the level of paramedic services. Those decisions have already happened. The decision is just about who's gonna pay for it. So there is no difference between option one, two, or three about the actual amount of service that's going to be offered. It's just a matter of how are we gonna work out the, the funding gap that we currently have. Okay. And um, since we, um since we're relatively confident that it's going to go to either media mediation or arbitration, what is the cost to the city in terms of dollars and staff time if we were to go in the worst case scenario for mediation and arbitration? Mr. McLeod? <clears throat> the two costs would be the cost of representation, we would do this in-house, and the cost shared of the portion of the mediation or the arbitration. Um, I can only sort of estimate tens of thousands of dollars in relation to, you know, a multi-day mediation for the mediator, but that would be very potentially high end. So I don't look at this as a process of, for example, entering into complex litigation. And as we note, the, the value, the total value between two and three is total just a little over $200,000. So the parties are also going to be inclined to keep that budget in mind. Mm -hmm. You know, Penny, not overspending to deal with an amount that is, relatively speaking, modest in terms of the overall budget. So you said you would do it in-house. May I ask, um, what opportunity cost are you deferring? Like, I assume you wouldn't be sitting at your desks doing nothing, and then you're doing this, so it wouldn't be that. Like, what would you be giving up as a result of having to do this extra work? Uh, lunches and evenings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, in our experience, when this thing does go to arbitration, what is the likelihood that we would actually get option two? That's predicting a little too far down the road. We would be confident in our position as we've gotten to this point. We have been able to read the files, for example, of the previous arbitration for 2005, in which we were quite successful. But it's based on, between here and then, gathering some information, perhaps even doing some studies jointly to make sure that we're agreeing on the type of fact um, model to present to the mediator and the arbitrator. So that we're dealing with, as much as possible, known facts and agreed upon facts, so we're working through the process to come to a solution. Um, that being the case, I don't like to speculate as to outcomes, but as I said in the past, we've been generally successful in these matters. Okay, and when you say successful, you mean closer to option two rather than closer to option three, but not exactly option two? Like, do, does anybody ever get exactly what they want? No. Okay. So if we were to go to arbitration, there'd be some cost in between option two and three, plus uh, lawyer fees, plus all that kind of stuff. So we're talking about essentially wasted money. Is that correct? As I say, I don't think we'd be looking at spending outside legal money. So indeed, it would be incorporated into it. That would be incorporated into existing budget. Okay. So as I see it, um, there is a certain justice in this because we are using it more than they are, and we're paying less than they are proportionately to what we're using. Um, it's a service that's a health service. I mean, this is a critical thing. I think nobody would actually want um, an ambulance to be late or anything like that as a result of this, because this is going on for several years. You mentioned that this year it may not affect us, but it will next year if we're going to have the same conversation. Um, and we're going to be going to mediation likely, more than likely. So we're going to be going above number two if we 
go with number two anyway. Um, it would seem better just to save your lunchtime and your evenings and avoid that altogether and uh, lawyer fees to these other guys that we're going to have if we were to take number three. Um, essentially, we're, we're paying for a service. We're growing. We need ambulance care, and it's going to go up. Uh, when we are paying for a service, that's what taxes are for. You're taxing for a service. And if you want to be secure and safe in your home and knowing that a paramedic is going to get there, <coughs> We need to pay for it. Now, I understand that uh, the provincial government is also cutting a bunch of stuff, and I suspect that uh, they'll be cutting their portion of whatever they fund us on this. Um, they're transferring, essentially, the, um, the cost of this from the income taxpayer to the property taxpayer. Yes, I'd like the income taxpayer to pay for it, not the property taxpayer, but Ford seems to think otherwise. Um, so I won't be supporting number two. I would be supporting number three if that were ever to come up. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I guess first a question. The, the letter from the CAO suggests that the, um, the rationale for option three essentially is to, has to do with um, staff cuts and the four hour a day minimum care. Um, is that, I know that we like, I guess first of all, that seems to me to be a policy that is unrelated to what we do here. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, interim say over. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm assuming that you're referring to the uh, Fairmount Home four hour of care um, internal policy that they've decided to set for yep. themselves, um, which is, you know, which is something that they have decided to do on their own. It is not legislated or mandated by any means by the province. So this is a decision that they've made independently to increase their level of service to achieve that. Great, thanks. That's, that's sort of what I was thinking. And I really do you know, fundamentally support the four-hour-a-day minimum care all across the province. But again, this is that's a, the provincial level, um, and therefore, Option two makes the most sense because going down the road of supporting what would be out of our jurisdiction, uh, valid as it is, important as it is, takes it outside of the scope of what we should even be considering. Um, so I certainly support option two. I think we need to consider, you know, going beyond our our um, the the financial constraints that we have here and our desire to. Um, keep the budget requests where we want them to be. I think we do need to look at what is behind the numbers to some extent. So increase in calls. Um, there, there are some factors that have led to this, including the op opioid crisis, mental health crisis, uh, and we have frontline staff. We have, we have paramedics who deal with those calls, and increase in calls leads to increase in injury um, and therefore increased costs. So. There are legitimate sort of societal factors, issues that are happening that I think really do require us to take this step. Uh, so I'm definitely supporting option two. Thank you. Next on my list is Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I think that there's two main aspects here we need to consider. One is the looming mediation and arbitration, which sort of forces our hand of what, what to do from a governance perspective financially. And the other one is the larger, the higher level aspect, the interaction with the, with the province, essentially, but not just the interaction with the province, the demographic shift combined with the rise in acuity amongst um, the, both the population that might need ambulances, which is an aging population, which we, as we know is now the largest demographic, and the population that's already in the Fairmount home and similar facilities, which is a, a rise in acuity. And by acuity, I mean how sick you are. I can testify from direct experience from my other job that the rise in acuity is real. This is happening at the same time as the climate uh, things that are happening, such as the Category 5 hurricane that's happening in Bahamas. These, these, this rise in acuity amongst our population, sicker and sicker people coming to hospital via ambulance, 
is real and it is a larger problem than either the county or the city can deal with on their own. Therefore, maybe we're best to just look at the governance issue of the finances uh, and separate the other gloomy picture coming our way because it affects all of, all of healthcare, all healthcare workers, all healthcare, healthcare budgets. And it's up to the province and ultimately the federal government to start doing something about it. So, you know, if you were in the Bahamas and the water was rising and you had a few sandbags, you know, you could argue with your family members how many sandbags to put down. But really, you need to maybe get, get back from the water. So we need a high level of solution to the rise in acuity and the need for more ambulance calls. The thing that has flooded my cardiac unit the entire summer uh, is the rise in acuity. So, you know, this budgetary dispute between us and the county is, has nothing to do with that. And therefore, we don't do us any services by picking option three because the up, there's very little upside in picking option three. We, we need to try to get a mediated settlement here and the, the best path to a good settlement is option two. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Doherty. Thank you. And through you, um, it was mentioned earlier that uh, we will have to go through this uh, over again next year. So um, with, the forced, with option two, it's likely that we will have mediation and arbitration. That's correct, right? Will that, is, it, is there a likelihood that that would be a very positive process to go through so we won't have to go through this again next year? Mr. McLeod? For seeing the future in that way sort of asks, will we have the same question? When we look at the agreements after the restructuring order, we see that we have six or seven agreements between 1997 and 2004. I expect every agreement came out of a disagreement, and the disagreement was solved by that agreement. I point that out to illustrate in the past on this just one arrangement with the county, we've had at least six or seven disagreements in needing clarification. So I wouldn't want to give the hope that this would solve all issues, especially in the context of the changes that are coming from upper level government. But we can expect that this matter of how we come to a budget, which I think is this year's matter, that we're asking is this municipality to have a greater say at the table perhaps, that would be one of the core issues at the mediation that we would hope to resolve through this process. So therefore, um, option two offers the best solution in the sense that it's as close as is possible to the budget that we were asked for, but at the same time will lead to a, a deeper conversation and mediation. And that'll support it. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I take the chair and recognize you. Thank you. So I certainly appreciate the discussion we've had around the table uh, on this item so far tonight. So this has actually been an ongoing discussion now for a number of months. The uh, warden of the county and I have spoken on many occasions on the phone and in person, and we have had very good discussions. We quickly identified that through a series of events that we had a gap. We had budgeted for a 5% increase. They came in with a 10% increase. And so we were trying to work collectively, the two of us, to try to find some way, some creative option to be able to somehow bridge the gap. Understanding that this is not about not valuing the services that are provided. Of course, they're very important. Uh, again, uh, those funding commitments have already been made. So what is the best approach moving forward? So I want to thank the warden for his help on this, trying to come up with creative solutions. This is what led to a meeting at the end of June, where we had a very good discussion, Councillor Bohm and Councillor Osterhoff were with me, and then some representatives from the county as well. And ultimately, we again talked about ways and options that perhaps we could find a way to somehow compromise and somehow bridge this gap. To be frank, the turning point for me was when 
the outcome of that RULAC meeting was then to go back to county council. And I was very surprised and quite frankly disappointed that not that county council rejected the offer of compromise. They didn't even want to discuss it. That was a concern to me because I believe that in the spirit of partnership, when these issues arise, it's important for us to discuss and see what we can do. So here we are. Now the ball is in our court. In my view, option two is exactly in the same vein of what the ward and I had been discussing, which was some compromise. Can we somehow meet in the middle when they're here and we're here? So this is basically restating our desire for compromise. Again, can we find creative solutions? As Deputy Mayor has said, is there something that's come from, from provincial funding? Are there other options available? We talked about even could we, you know, we're, for option two, we're gonna have to put some of our reserves on the table. So we talked about, well, is there an option for the county to put some of their reserves on the table? Again, to maintain that spirit of partnership moving forward. So I'm hopeful. I think that this is, this is actually us extending a hand to the county saying, okay, we want to partner with you, we want to work, please work with us and let's see what kind of compromises is possible. So I don't think that mediation or arbitration is an absolute uh, option. We may end up there, and if we do, so be it. But I think it's important for us at the end of the day to say a 10% budget ask is simply too high. It's four times higher than our budget increase and I don't believe it's fair to all of our other external agencies and partners when they are all working very hard to try to reduce their asks that we would then be treating one of our partners differently from the other. So this is a statement from us that yes, on the one hand, we want to compromise in partnership, but we also have to recognize fair play with our other external agencies as well. So for that reason, I will absolutely support option two. would encourage council to support that as well. The other thing that I will say is that at the end of the day, there was some miscommunication on both sides. Everyone acted in good faith here, and there would be no suggestion otherwise in that. But one of the things that Warden and I did talk about is that we will have another RULAC meeting before our 2020 budget, where we will sit down and we will talk about each other's budget targets, and we will try to avoid this situation happening again in 2020. So I look forward to that discussion, but I also look forward to discussions on resolving this issue with the 2019 budget. Thank you very much. I yield the chair to you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that has not spoken that wishes to speak? Okay, we will call the vote then on option number two. Please vote. And that carries by a vote of 12 to 1. Okay, moving on to report number 68 from Planning Committee. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Deputy Mayor Kiley, that report number 68 from the Planning Committee be received and adopted. Okay, so there are three items. If no one would like any of them separated, we will vote on them as a whole. Number one is amendment to draft plan of subdivision conditions, 700 Gardeners Road. Number two, approval of an application for zoning bylaw amendment, 1381 Newport Avenue. And number three, approval of an application for zoning bylaw amendment 235 and 243 Colburn Street and 6062 and 64 Elm Street. We'll call the vote, please. Um, we have a member of council who is not signed out, so we're going to sign that member of council out, and I will recall the vote. Bear with us for just a moment, please. Okay, so this, this oh. is not the result. I will now recall the vote. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, 
On to report number 69 from Heritage Kingston. I have the report from Heritage Kingston, uh, duly moved and seconded. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Doherty, seconded by Councillor Neal, that report number 69 from Heritage Kingston be received and adopted. Okay, so there are several items. Would anyone like any of those items separated? Councillor Doherty? Yes, I would like uh, number two and number three separated. Oh, okay. So that is, is that heading so, number two okay. and heading number three? The big, okay. Okay, so first, so we'll, we'll deal with them one heading at a time. So first, number one, applications recommended for approval. Uh, statutory consultation with Heritage Kingston. We'll call the vote. Waiting for one, please. Yes, I'll, I'll get to you. Okay. So, so I think I, I think we need to do a public service announcement that if you go to the bathroom, you have to sign out first. Is that is that the issue that we're running into again? No, we have eleven members present and ten members okay. have voted. We are waiting for one okay. member to vote. Okay. Okay, could all members of council please re-vote? This is item one, right? This is one only. And that carries. Okay, so now we'll do number two. Application supported for approval by Heritage Kingston non-statutory consultation. So there are two sub-items. Councillor Doherty, did you want both of them uh, separated? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, so first is approval of application for heritage permit under the Ontario Heritage Act, 72 to 82 Sydenham Street. That's correct, and that's for the, the Spire uh, project, and I have a motion prepared for this that I would like to put on the floor. Okay, so this is a motion to amend, moved by Councillor Doherty, seconded by Councillor Neal. Thank you. So, is to amend, number one, delete the word not and the words and the applicant shall remove these items from the plan so the bullet reads as follows. Propose it to install a bench and lamppost on the city's right of way are approved. Councillor Doherty, would you like to speak to the amendment? Thank you. Um, so this is for the spire, the, the church, and what they're trying to do is create a more accessible um, entry way. They are changing the pathways with the ramp into the church, and with this project, they would like to also install a bench and a lamp post uh, to, to offer more visibility at, in during the evening. And we had. Um, Great discussion around this issue on, uh, at Heritage Committee, and we Heritage Committee is very supportive of this project, um, and so we have decided uh, that the two councillors of the committee would move this motion that we do um, uh, we do take out the word "not approved," but and that we are approving the proposal to install a bench and a lamppost on the city's right of way are approved. Okay, uh, Councilor Neal. Just very quickly, part of the background for this is, and the awkwardness around uh, this recommendation at first, is that mo many schools, most schools, most churches in our community are zoned residential. And the, the rules that apply to residential zoning are quite different than they are for institutional zoning. And so that creates, on occasion, a kind of awkwardness around, uh, around proposals. This is a really good plan 
that allows uh, what is now a great community asset to be more accessible to the to the community broadly. Uh, and as the previous speaker pointed out, uh, the committee itself were supportive of this, and the representative for the spire spoke strongly about uh, tweaking it in this way. So I hope this passes uh, unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McLaren. Thank you. Just a quick question. Why did it come to us as a not then if the uh, committee agreed to it and everybody seems to think this is a good idea? Uh, Ms. Agnew. Thank you, and through you, I'll provide some introductory comments, and then Commissioner Kidd, I believe, will have some additional comments as well. So in the process of reviewing this application, it circulated to the different technical departments within the city. As part of the technical comments that came back from engineering services, some concerns were expressed with respect to the location of the bench being within the city right-of-way and the lamp post, because it's contrary to our policies with respect to right-of-way protection. So that was part of the discussion that took place at Heritage Kingston and why you find in the original recommendation that came from staff a non-support of that particular element of the proposal. And I'll let Commissioner Kidd offer any additional comments. Ms. Kidd. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I was briefed by staff on this matter this afternoon as well. And uh, the, the technical answer is that we, uh, we always try to protect the road allowance uh, and the city's right-of-way so that if we have to do work within the right-of-way or any underground work, um, that we're not facing any encumbrances. So, so essentially, that's the reason. The bench as it exists today is, is partially on the private property and uh, a small portion of it on the right-of-way. But it would require, this change would require it to come into the right-of-way. So I think, um, I think that's the reason. We, we don't have any provision in our encroachment bylaw to allow for this. Probably the bigger concern is um, setting a precedence, which, which uh, we tend to always concern ourselves with. Um, I don't think it's the end of the world, and we certainly commend the, uh, the project as proposed and the accessibility of it. And I, but I think the greater concern, the bench is something that can be moved, um, if, if necessary, quite easily, I believe. But the lighting post itself, uh, with electricity running to it, uh, is a bit more problematic. Thank you. And um, you mentioned that there could be costs to encumbrances uh, if we were to need to dig in there. Like, is that prohibitive, or is there an extra danger or anything like that? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, in the right of way, um, we restrict it so that if we do have to to dig or or access the area or for future road widening or sidewalk widening or something like that, it it's completely <coughs> unencumbered because it's within the right of way, uh, the city's right of way in the road allowance. Um, if there, we we do allow in our encroachment bylaw. Sometimes we have uh, temporary agreements. And uh, if that's the case, there are stipulations, but there's no provision in our current encroachment bylaw for something like this. So I suspect if we had to do work, we would have to uh, relocate whatever we were, whatever we was encumbering us, and that would probably be at the city's expense to put it back as, as was found if we allowed this, that's all. Okay. And uh, you mentioned that we don't have a bylaw for this. Um, I understood uh, during the capital debate that uh, bylaws are not that easily changed. Are we allowed to change a bylaw legally that, like that tonight? An encumbrance bylaw? Uh, Mr. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to ask for some assistance perhaps from our legal director on that matter. Mr. McLeod. We may have to have a follow-up report to clarify what is being done. We also, I would expect, the Heritage Committee would not have been defining where and in what uh, type of technology is going in the lamppost. This is just a preliminary approval to put the idea onto the, uh, into the place, uh, into the space. Is that correct? And that's what I understand to be correct. Okay. Mr. Kidd. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, despite the bylaw, I believe that council can make 
a decision uh, outside of, of a bylaw if, if that's what council chooses. Okay. So I'll give an example. We have a procedural bylaw and almost every meeting we waive the procedural bylaw. So I think that it's fine to say that council can absolutely. I we're believe we were given bylaws. different, uh, we were given different instructions during the capital debate when we had a re-vote, but the bylaw stood because apparently there were uh, requirements for capital uh, um, for public consultation. And since this is a land use thing, I believe that that bylaw may, you know, may take effect here. So it granted for some bylaws, yes, we can change them, but I suspect that land use bylaw might have stricter requirements. And that's what I was referring to. Uh, last thing, who pays for setting up the light and the electricity for this light ongoing? And about how much would it be? Uh, who would like to uh, take a stab at that? <laughs> Ms. Agnew. Uh, thank you, and through you, it's my understanding that because this is associated with the overall project that's being proposed by the applicant, that the expense would be at the applicant's expense for those items in particular. And we would, if we needed to work on them, we would then have to replace them if we moved them or anything like that. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, my understanding is if we allow for something to encroach in the right of way and we have to uh, remove it uh, temporarily to do work or whatever, it would be our responsibility then to put it back uh, in a like fashion. Thank you. Okay. Huh. Next on my list is Councillor Osanek. My questions were basically answered by okay. Councillor McLaren. Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, this is in my district, and I used to live across the street, so I know the property very well. I know the Spire um, uh, facility quite well. But what I can't tell from these pictures, and I don't know whether it came up at committee, is exactly where the lamppost is going. The bench to me is not that big a deal, even if it needs to be moved. Like uh, the commissioner said, the bench can be moved, even if it's bolted down, it can still be moved quite easily. Uh, but the lamppost, I mean, we have lampposts in the right of way all over the district, all over the heritage district. Uh, the city installed the, the, the lampposts in those spots and uh, people deal with it, but none of them are blocking the sidewalk. So I guess my question is, does this lamppost block pedestrian use in any way? Ms. Agnew. Uh, thank you, and through you, I actually don't know that right off the top of my head. I don't believe we have that level of detail that was provided to us through the application. Okay, so I gotta think here. So this is a heritage district, so therefore it is a part five application. So the heritage application has a time limit, but this barrier, which is the lamppost to our decision making, has nothing to do with the heritage district other than what was in the report on how lamp, lamps have to appear in a heritage district, but that's not the issue. It's the location of the lamppost that we need to know. So my, if, if anyone knows that answer, great. Uh, put up your hand. Like, because you were there during discussion, but if you don't know, I think we need to know that information before we vote, because that, that's Clerk. crucial to my position on this. Mr. Clerk, can I see you for a moment? Peter. So I have a, so as the chair, I just have a question of staff. Is this, is this item time sensitive? So I'm actually just gonna make this, make a suggestion because I feel like, yeah, uh, Ms. Agnew. 
Thank you, sorry, and through you, I was able to locate the drawing that was submitted as part of the application. So what is proposed is that the lamp post is going to be going adjacent to the widened walkway, but it will not be within the actual sidewalk. So it looks like there's a, a free span of sidewalk for pedestrians to be conveyed across the property, through the property. It's just that the city's right of way goes wide enough that it goes onto the property where you wouldn't actually think that it is, but it's technically city property. So I don't believe that it would obstruct the movement of people. Okay, thank you, thank that's you. very helpful. So I'm imagining what you're saying is that a lamppost on the accessible walkway towards the spire, which is technically on the city right of way, on the edge of the city right of way, but not encroaching on the sidewalk, encroaching on the edge of the right of way. And from uh, talking briefly with Councillor Osterhoff, who is, of course, electrical contractor by trade, I understand that the lamppost could be made wireless and therefore be a lot easier to move if needed. So with that in mind, I will support this amendment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so Councilor Doherty, you do have the last word unless you are responding with information from a comment that's already been made. Thank you, and through you, I was going to respond with the suggestions of slightly amending the motion, which may solve the discussion that we're having tonight. Okay. Okay, so the suggestion is that we request that these items receive heritage approval with inst installation pending approval through other departments and municipal procedures deemed appropriate. In other words, that this uh, application, that we can still, that the applicant can still have, uh, resolve these issues through engineering, but they will not have to go through the heritage process again. Okay, so if I'm clear, your proposal is to amend your motion to amend, to add a line that says, so the proposal to install a bench and lamppost on the city's right of way are approved pending approval from relevant city departments. Exactly. Can I get just some comment from staff in terms of, is that wording understood, what that means? Before. Mr. McLeod? I probably said this not as clearly as I wished earlier. But there will be ancillary permits. So as was described earlier, this is an encroachment. We have an encroachment bylaw. There's probably a permit process. There will be technical requirements to make sure the lamp's electricity connects with our system correctly. Those are permits that would come through the engineering department. Okay. So I, I have another suggestion here. If this is not time sensitive, can we just defer this to our next council meeting until we can get some of this information clarified because we're going down the rabbit hole and we're going to be spending an hour talking about where the lamppost is on the property and i feel like there are some other items on our agenda tonight that probably require our attention and discussion is that is that reasonable would somebody like to move a motion to defer to the next meeting thank you moved by councillor hill seconded by councillor hutchison thank you please vote And that carries. Okay, so now under item two of number two, approval and application for heritage permit under the Ontario Heritage Act 52 to 56 Earl Street. Councillor Doherty. I've also prepared a motion for this one to then the clerk has, and I wonder if you could put it up on the screen. This is for the wall, the stone wall. I believe the 9092 Barrack Street was the motion that you gave me. So, Councilor Doherty, that is Which referring is to report three. item three in our agenda. Oh, we're all still on the original? Yeah. So, you don't have anything to say to number two of number two? Does anyone want to speak to number item number two under number two? 
so two I two I I. Okay, so we'll call the vote then on fifty two to fifty six Earl Street. And that carries. Okay, so now we are on item three, reporting on results of Ontario Regulation 9 slash 06, review and heritage easement agreement under the Ontario Heritage Act 90 to 92 Barrick Street. Councillor Doherty. Thank you. So we have a motion that is going to be on the screen in a minute. And that is to, uh, it's a, f a motion to defer this, um, to give staff time to, um, so Heritage Committee asked for a quote from a heritage mason, and we know um, we know masons are hard to come by, it's, it's, and all the trades are very busy at the moment. So we would like to defer this by a month to give staff time to f to get a quote from a stone mason, a heritage stone mason. Okay, so we have a motion to defer. It's been moved by Councillor Doherty, seconded by Councillor Neal. A discussion on the motion to defer? Time or place? Councillor McLaren. Does the time affect the difference between a stonemason and a heritage stonemason? So wait, can, you, can you say that one more time? I didn't, I didn't hear that question. In order to make it to time or place, I asked because the... Um, the proposer suggested that they wanted a heritage stonemason, but it says a stonemason only. If there's a difference with regards to finding the time to find a heritage stonemason versus a regular stonemason, and if that's important or not. So does staff have any concern with getting um, a quote from a stonemason in the next month? Ms. Agnew. No, staff have no concerns. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else to time or place? Seeing none, we will call the vote on the motion to defer, please. And that carries. Okay, report number 70 from the Administrative Policies Committee. Thank you, Your Worship. I rise to uh, submit report number 70, uh, Administrative Policies, and uh, you're going to have to pay attention for this one because there are some nuances. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Councillor Chappelle, that report number 70 from the Administrative Policies Committee be received and adopted. Okay, so there are three clauses. I'm going to take a wild stab at this, that number two should probably be separated. Would anyone like number one and number three separated? Number one? Okay, so we'll do them in order. Number one, policy on council staff relations. Councillor Chappelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've been think, speaking about this one for quite a while. I certainly appreciate the, uh, the effort of putting this together and the guiding principles that members and city staff will treat each other with respect at all times, including respect for private lives for each. And um, one of the items that uh, I would like to bring to attention is under the role of members in section 3.2, clarifying the roles, under the role of members, subsection two, item F. I would just like some clarity with regards to the phrasing of item F that says, to only give direction to city staff through resolution by council as a whole. I'm certainly hoping that the intent of this statement is not to prevent city council staff members, or city uh, council staff members, the option to or re refrain from working collaboratively with City Council. And what I mean by that is there are sometimes concerns from constituents that I'd like to bring forward to staff, and I'd like to ensure that staff are going to be able to respond accordingly to my query or to the query of any of my fellow colleagues. And so perhaps um, uh, CAO Hurdle can provide some context on this for me. In terms of Hurdle? Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So the intent is absolutely not to limit the working relationship or collaboration between city staff and members of council. Um, you know, it, it does happen quite frequently that um, 
members of council will reach out to city staff to um, to try to work through some issues in their um, in their district. So that's not the intent, but maybe to give you an example of where this could apply is if you wanted as a councillor a traffic signal, for example, in your district, you wouldn't have the ability as a councillor to direct a city staff to go ahead and implement a traffic signal. This would have to actually come through as a motion of council because there would be budgetary implication and there would also be quite a lot of time uh, from a staff perspective that would be required to do that work. Just for clarity, would that also apply to stop signs? Commissioner Kidd. Through you, Mr. Mayor, this is a slippery slope, but, but um, my, my answer would be when, when uh, when a situation fits within the approved policies and there's a budget approved, if staff can accommodate, they do try. But if staff does not recommend uh, or support uh, the recommendation, then the individual counselor's desire is, is not much more than that of a citizen. That's why council as a whole comes together with motions. Okay, thank you. So we will call the vote on clause one. And that carries by a vote of 12 to one. Number two, discounted fees for municipal programs and services. So I'm just gonna make a couple of comments first just, just to guide the discussion on this. So this has come with a negative recommendation, so I will remind people when it comes to vote, but what that means is that a yes vote here at council confirms the decision of administrative policies. So if it's a negative recommendation, it means administrative policies has said no, and so if you agree with that decision, then you would vote yes. So we'll go over this again when it comes to voting, but just so everyone's clear with that. The other piece to keep in mind is, of course, that um, this is part of a report with a number of different options that were presented by staff. The staff recommendation is for option C. So we will not amend option C. We will have a debate and discussion on option C, and we will take a vote on option C. And if it loses, then there will be an opportunity for any other member of council to put forward a different option. And then we will discuss and debate, and we will basically go as long as until something passes or until we don't want to present any other option. So is everyone clear on the, the roadmap for this? Okay, so with that, the staff recommendation is now on the floor. So anybody else, anybody that wishes to speak to it? Nobody, should we take the vote right now? Oh, yes, Councilor Neal. Yes, um, this uh, proposal I believe came up in our last council. And I spoke at the time, uh, and I haven't changed my opinion. I, the reality is, and I use my mother as an example, she survived and grew up during the Depression. I don't believe she would ever have taken an income tax form to a social services department to request a minor discount on a service that was provided municipally. Uh, it just was never within her DNA <laughs> to ever consider doing that. And so I'm a little troubled by this. The other thing is I think that whenever possible, services should be universal. We don't request, we don't have a two-tier medical uh, coverage and charge people extra because they make extra money. We charge them extra when we tax them. And that allows for a certain universality to take place. And 
Um, the reality is, yes, there are some seniors, uh, one sitting in this chair, that uh, have fairly good retirement incomes. But I also, for 30 years, have paid taxes relative to my, the value of my home. And I don't know why we're trying to create this two-tiered system. I, I would support right now uh, the idea of not charging, like allowing seniors uh, bus passes. I called last year and again this year about a dozen municipalities in, in Ontario and I couldn't find one that didn't have some form of discount for seniors. And there are other ways of helping seniors with transit issues. Halifax has a brilliant idea, uh, and you could do it for one or two days a week. Halifax allows free transit to seniors in non-peak times on Tuesdays. And therefore, people who are retired could plan their, their trips around that day or two a week when you got, when you could ride for free in non-peak times. And so I think there's ways that we can address this issue but I, I believe that having a discount, and I'm quite willing to support a deeper discount, and I'm quite willing to support uh, a discount and, uh, and a form of free busing. But I just know seniors that I know uh, would feel comfortable going to social services and requesting uh, this. So for that reason, I don't think it's a viable suggestion. And I think we should maintain the universality of our dis seniors discounting. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. I have two questions to start and then a few comments. And I want to build off Councillor Neal's comments about the delivery of the service. And there is great discussion about that at administrative policy of which I'm a member. And I'm hoping staff can articulate what they did then now, now about the delivery of the service. Um, so question to staff, could you explain how a potential means-based discount would be applied? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the process is quite simple. Uh, if it's a single uh, senior or a couple, um, they bring in their NOAs and staff look at line 236, which shows their net income and staff determine whether they're above or below that income threshold. And if they are eligible for the program, they receive a card um, that basically gives them access to all of the services within the Mike Kingston program. That structure and intake process was developed with the Poverty Roundtable many years ago when the program was uh, established. Uh, in fact, 10 years ago, almost this month. Um, so that's the process now. What's in the report and what we're looking at doing is augmenting that by switching to a two-year eligibility. So you need to come in once every two years, not once a year, uh, to make it easier. And uh, also developing an online um, portal where people can apply online so they don't actually physically need to come into the office to access the program, uh, which may be of interest to some seniors. I understand some won't want that option, but certainly we uh, have a number of seniors in our community who are um, 
on computers and use them regularly. Um, and then thirdly, the other thing we're going to go back to doing that we've gotten a bit away from is doing intake in other locations. So for example, we do eligibility. It's a pretty mobile program because it is so simple. Uh, we can do intake at the senior center. We currently do it at Rideau Heights Community Center as well as uh, Montreal Street, but uh, we could look at doing intake. We used to do it in the front lobby down here at City Hall uh, in one of the meeting rooms. So there's a number of other locations where we could offer the service as well to make it a little more accessible to uh, members of our community. Thank you. So if I could paraphrase that response, is it fair to say that it will be an easy process, it will be potentially private if it can be done online in the comfort of your home, and it will be decentralized if you choose to do it outside of your home, you can do it in other city locations so you don't necessarily have to go to the social assistance building itself. Is that a fair recap? Yes. Thank you, and I think that those points address Councillor Neal's good points about uh, who this could impact potentially adversely. And hopefully those of you who had those similar concerns will see that those have been well addressed in this report. And I think this report also well addresses what the My Kingston program was designed to do. We heard a moment ago that uh, this came out of the Mayor's Task Force on Poverty about 10 years ago. And in other words, it's intended to help those who are in need, and that's exactly what Option C does. It deepens the discount while at the exact same time lessening the burden on the taxpayer, which I think is incredibly important. We're actually doing more with less, or you could say it's more effective and more efficient at once, which makes it good public policy. But of course, good public policy isn't just theoretical. It actually impacts real people's lives. And I thought I'd share very briefly two experiences that I had that solidified why this is a good option in my mind. And the first came from uh, this past municipal campaign. One of the first doors that I knocked on was a man who was working full time. He had two young kids and his wife was working part time so she could bring in some income but be at home with the kids uh, for the other time. And their combined income as minimum wage workers, full time and part time, was about $39,000 which would put them over the current threshold of support from the My Kingston program. But obviously, with $39,000 for four people, it essentially made everything except food and shelter a non-starter. A non they couldn't afford to put their kids in rec programs. They could hardly afford to get on the bus. And I think that's a big problem. So this recommendation, which asks us to raise the threshold of who can be eligible to this program, is really essential for working class families. And more than that, as I said, it deepens the discount. So they're not only going to get 20% off, they're going to get 50% off. So for these kids who can't access recreational activities, who can't be in sports, it could be a big game changer. So this is who it's for. In my mind, who it is not for, and this is the, the second experience I want to share, comes from my research with seniors and looking at uh, particularly aging well in rural communities. And what I found is, perhaps not surprising, that is, people who have pensions from a long storied career of working, people who have government support in addition to that, and people who have property and family support, so kind of four major financial streams, don't really need discounted governmental programs. So what this option does is recognize that and says, for those who have that ability, those who have that means, we shouldn't be supporting. But those who don't and those who need the support, we should, and we should do that in a more meaningful way. So for that reason, I hope that everyone will support this. It's good financially and socially. And I thank staff for this great recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so the, I guess I just want to start with uh, just building a little bit on Councillor Kiley's comments and also in response to something that Councillor Neal brought up. This report was not brought to us because um, there was any desire to take something away. It was brought forward because the existing policy for our municipal discounts is, is to ensure that programs and services are accessible to people on low incomes. So at a certain time in our history, the, the groupings, the age-based discounts factored in income, though it was more of a universal age-based uh, approach. This report, all the work that staff have put into this, 
is trying to keep us in line with current policy. And if someone would like to have a new policy that's related to any age-based reasons that we should be doing things, that's, that's another idea. But it is actually separate from what we are speaking about. We're speaking about need, and the need that has been demonstrated by the research and by the staff report is not in the age category where the, there is currently a discount. And in fact, the costs are going up increasingly over the next coming years because of, of what's happening with that demographic. So I just want to clarify that first of all, this is about policy, it shouldn't be about rhetoric, it's not about who's getting what and who deserves what. It's about the fact that there are individuals in this community, as Councillor Kiley has mentioned, who cannot access programs and services that are not just a convenience or a luxury or something to do on a Saturday afternoon. They are a matter of improving one's life, um, quality of life, improving their health, improving their ability to access education, um, new employment opportunities, for example, groceries. We had a program which we were, were quite proud of in the last term of council that was dedicated to providing free transit to uh, recipients of Ontario Works. We've received information from staff on what that program accomplished. What it accomplished was a huge increase in ridership with a vulnerable population. And what those, those transit trips did for those people, 84% of those people had increased access to, they used it for personal appointments, for employment opportunities, to do things like get groceries. So what this report is about is about increasing access and deepening the discount to ensure that those people who are struggling with their household budget have the opportunity to access a, what they need and to ensure that their children have future opportunities. That's what we're dealing with today. This recommendation came back with more information, more options. Um, the, you know, we, we've said as a council we're committed to 2.5% tax rate increase. Uh, this do, goes a long way to, to supporting us and bringing down the costs. And, you know, not to mention the fact that with increased ridership and transit, just as an example, we see an increase in the gas tax revenue, which accounts for 8% of the road repair budget that the city of Kingston um, that, that we have, and that's another priority that council has. So it's good policy all around. This is, um, it's, it's a clear step forward in terms of equity, and many people who sit on this council would like to talk about progressive policies and progressive attitudes, and, and I, I would argue that this is the best way to demonstrate a progressive approach. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hill. Thank you, Your, uh, Your Worship. And uh, I, uh, at the risk of getting in trouble with all my old friends, I completely agree with what uh, Councillor Kiley and Councillor Holland have said. The, uh, I'm a pretty good example of exactly what we're talking about in this community. I worked in a, in a school board. This uh, community used to be an industrial community, and it's not anymore. And in those days, people uh, uh, didn't have adequate pensions, they didn't have adequate uh, salaries uh, or uh, hourly rates to be able to put money aside for uh, for their old age. And so in many cases, I think we introduced uh, 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 these kinds of discounts, senior discounts, in order to address the fact that when people moved out of the workforce in those days, they did move into a uh, lower income bracket, and in some cases, many cases, into poverty. The community has changed substantially since that time. So this is really a much sector community, right? This is People work in municipalities, they work in universities and school boards and hospitals and government. Uh, and I read, uh, and, and they have good pensions, and I think I understood uh, what, what I read that the median income for seniors, retired people in this community, is actually uh, at the level of the median income for the, for the community as a whole. So it's, it, you know, people who are retired people in this community, for the most part, are doing quite well. And I would be, as I said, a, a pretty good example of that kind of person. If you're at, I read somewhere where uh, uh, one, of the, one of my colleagues indicated that you know, immediately upon retirement, you're poorer than you've ever been because by definition, you make less money. Well, that's, that's really not the case because you have much more disposable income than you've ever had. 10 years ago, I had kids in university. I had car payments. I had a mortgage. I don't have any of those things now. And again, I've, I've had a very blessed life. I feel very fortunate. 
to be able to say that. But I don't need a discount. That's an absolute certainty. And I think many, many of uh, my uh, fellow senior citizens in the, in the community also would suggest that uh, their income levels are, are such that they don't require those kinds of discounts either. What we do need to do is address the level of poverty among other citizens. We, we need to make sure that, that kids and young families have access to the services that this community can provide. And if, if I, I'll, redirecting some of the, the resources that go to folks like me who don't need them, to folks who do need them, is a very good allocation of resources. It's responsible, it makes sense for our community, it addresses a, a really obvious and particular need, and it's not uh, at the uh, expense of, uh, of sort of a, a marginal income uh, uh, for, for, for many of our seniors, because many of our seniors are doing very well, and, uh, and I think they would acknowledge that too. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why our seniors give back to their community so much. They, they volunteer. I, I, I also heard, you know, read that it's sort of in recognition for the level of volunteer work that senior citizens do in our community. Well, they do that, I think, uh, as I do, for uh, lots of different reasons. And, uh, and mostly it's because they want to give back because they've experienced a pretty uh, uh, fortunate opportunity to, to, uh, to uh, grow their families and their and their uh, their own uh, their own life here in in this community so i i agree with uh, the option c and I, that's i hope what, what council will vote for thank you councillor doherty thank you and through you shortly after being elected i received a phone call from a woman who uh, has an income of 17400 and she was not. She couldn't get a discount on the bus. Um, so this bus pass discount that really could have helped her, helped her put more food on the table, or helped her pay her rent or utilities, was not. She wasn't able to access it because she was earning seventeen thousand four hundred dollars. And I tried to help her as much as I could, but. I couldn't from a city perspective at the time. So this option C will see people like her and anybody earning under $25,000 as, as a single person being able to access our services. And as uh, so I would like to echo what Councillor um, Holland said that this ensures that the money that we are spending goes to the people who need it. And at the same time, it'll keep our tax increases to the promised increases that we have set already. So I think this is the best decision for all of the taxpayers in Kingston because we're going to ensure that people who do need the support will get it. So I'll support option C. Thank you. Councillor Stroud. Thank you. So I remember I said at the very beginning, as I just in, inserted the, the nuance, I said there's going to be nuance on this. So there's two very different things uh, in, in this recommendation. And recommend, it just if you turn to page 251 of your package, you'll see the table with options A, B, C, D, E, F, G on it. And, and it's useful because it actually shows you a bunch of different combinations of the two different things. It's apples and oranges apples and oranges. So um, option C, if you're following, which is what was recommended by staff after the staff analysis, is to eliminate the age-based discount and provide only the income-based discounts, changing the threshold from the very low LICO to the LIM 15, right? So most of the comments from the from the four previous speakers had to do with that aspect, that the progressive uh, policy making would demand that higher income-based threshold, the LIM-15, as is recommended. And there was a little bit of uh, explanation of why it was okay to scrap the seniors' discount, um, because it was not needed, as Councillor Hill said, or, be, or because, uh, and, and times have changed, or because the people that are that need the discounts will still be able to get them if they apply, uh, which is a little bit more debatable. But the, the point is, it's two different things. So you have to decide in your mind 
about the senior's discount, and then you have to separately decide in your mind about increasing the threshold for the discount, the discounted services. Um, and there's a menu there, right? So you could leave it as is at the LICO. You could go to the intermediate threshold, which is the LIM AT. You could go to the higher threshold, which is the recommended uh, option C, which is the LIM 15. And then you, as you see, as you go down the list, there's the next four options retain some or all of the senior discounts. So option D, reduce the age base discount 15% and go to the intermediate LIM AT or reduce it 15% and go up to the LIM 15. So that's D and E. And then F would be keep the age base discount exactly the same, go to the intermediate threshold at LIM AT or G, the uh, keep the senior discounts and go to the LIM 15. So I would suggest that option G actually is, does also um, exactly the same thing for the threshold, the LIM 15, the, the problem being that it continues the age-based discounts. So then you go over to the projections. And those numbers down that column, that's what they are, the projections, okay? They're not real numbers. They're not, none of them are, are measured numbers. And that's where this report lost me. This report from staff lost me on those projected numbers. I, I did not agree with, the, with some of the assumptions, and I don't, did not agree with the uh, outcome of their projections. I did not agree that the 962,000 would be a real cost as compared to uh, the current. So according to the report, there would be an extra $209,000 in 2021 between option A and option G, okay? And that's with the status quo, without changing anything. Okay? So that $209,000, to me, it's not worth it. It's not that some seniors might be able to live without a discount. The fact is, as Councillor Neal said, we, they, they will be shocked if we remove it. And I don't think it's right to remove it. And I don't think that the, the amount of money we might save, according to an estimate, is anywhere near correct justification for removing it. What we need to do is separate the two items, discuss what threshold is appropriate, and I'm, I think LIM 15 is probably a good threshold, so I agree with the councillors on that point. But I, I guess what I'm saying is either we leave it exactly the same or we discuss option G. 30 seconds. And so I will be, as I did at committee, voting in favour of the negative recommendation to say no to option C. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Uh, Councillor Rosanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll be supporting the motion as we have it, which is not to approve it because I want the seniors' discounts to stay as is. When this came up in 2017, I think it came to admin policy twice in 2017, and I received so many emails from my constituents who are seniors asking, pleading, please do not touch the discounts. Like, I received a lot of traffic on this topic from my constituents, phone, by email, a lot, and that continued on when we brought this forward. Again, when the survey came out a few months ago, and then when, you know, like, leading up to tonight's conversation. So... I made a commitment to them that I would keep the seniors' discount as is. And that is because, as Councillor Neal said, there's a lot of other cities that also offer seniors' discounts. Like, we made a headline in 2017 on CBC News because we were actually considering removing the seniors' discount, and no one else, no other municipality had tried that at that point. Then we saw um, in early 2018 that London, the city of London, phased out their transit discount to seniors. And since the election last year, right now, the new council is trying to bring the seniors' discount back to their transit. I don't want to make that same mistake. I understand that what we're deciding tonight, like for me saying this, it is a political decision. I understand you know, the policy that he, um, other councillors were conveying, and I get that. And I also want to thank staff for trying to put all the numbers 
you know, all the data, the numbers that they've crunched since 2017, I understand that too, and thank you for doing all that work, but it is a political decision whether to remove the seniors' discounts or not, and I don't want to do that. Another thing that happened in the West End was that, as we've heard, the YMCA swimming pool and the entire fitness facility in the West End, you know, is no longer available, and um, fitness is so important to seniors, and that's what I was hearing a lot from, too. Now the seniors in the West End, if they do want to go swimming, they're going to have to go down to Artillery Park. You know, it's an opportunity for them has been removed and if we can still provide them a discount you know when they get to artillery park you know if they might have to pay for parking now you know every little bit counts and um, I'll be supporting the motion that we have which is not to approve the recommendation thank you thank you Councillor Bohm Thank you, Your Worship and through you I know there's been a lot of talk about this in the public and uh, I think, as was pointed out before, is these should very much so be treated as two distinct issues. Um, one is basically the age-based discount, and the other one would be the limb and the 15 and kind of what the right number is there and what should be provided there. So I think you've probably heard around the table, I think there's some appetite to explore the limb number a little bit more in the future to see, be, to see what can be done there. But I think that in pairing this with taking away the age-based discount is, is basically what's made this not palatable. Um, the vast majority of the public, um, if I read right here, it says, if age-based discounts are discontinued, those aged 18 and 24 and 65 plus with household incomes over the recommended limb 15 threshold would no longer have access to discounts. For young adults 18 to 24 years old, this is estimated to be approximately 9,000 individuals based on the Statistics Canada data for 15 to 24 four-year-olds shown in figure six. For seniors, this would be approximately 20,645 individuals. So no matter how you slice or dice this, there's going to be about 20,645 seniors that will no longer be eligible for an age-based discount that have lived their entire life knowing that once they got to eight, that to that age that they would be eligible for these discounts. So that's a lot of people that we're likely going to hear from tomorrow. And as we have a previous example of where it was taken away and now it's, it's being fought to come back, I don't think that that's something that would really be politically um, feasible. And I also don't think it's something that when somebody's kind of already been part of this program and now you're going to go take it from them, uh, I don't think that's something that is really going to go over too well in the community. And, and if we haven't heard very much uproar about this yet, uh, if this passes uh, and removes the discount, wait until tomorrow. The other thing to, to factor in here is that it already states that 85% or more of those individuals who are eligible for the age-based discount are not currently utilizing them. So to Councillor Stroud's point, a lot of the costs that, that we're portraying to that age group are, are not even being realized. Only 15% of them are accessing it. If their circumstances were to change, then they could take more quickly advantage of that discount if they need to. Uh, when speaking to the fact that if they have a greater ability to pay than they should pay, part of the problem was when I read this report is there were some justifications that kind of leaned one way and some justifications that kind of leaned another way. Some of the numbers didn't really add up. And then in the end, you just get this, we, we sort of recommend C. But you're really talking about 150000 and maybe $200,000 range spanned out over five or six years, which that's not a lot of money. So in my mind, you're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul, if I may. It, and that, that really doesn't benefit anybody. The other factor would be the fact that if a lot of these seniors have a greater ability to pay and they're not accessing the discount as it stands right now, one could argue that if they have a greater ability to pay and they have a nicer property, they're already paying higher property taxes and therefore they already are paying a higher proportion into the system. So, I mean, I don't know how you could really spin that any differently, but in most of their minds, they live most of their lives paying into the system. And this is kind of just a little bit of a, a reward when they finally get there. So to take that away, to simply provide a little bit more funding somewhere else, I think the better discussion would be keep the age-based discounts, have the discussion about the LIM15 separately. Separate those two things out, I think you might have a different result. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Councillor Chappelle. Yes, through your worship. I actually uh, canvassed my neighbourhood after the last Amendment Policy uh, Committee meeting where this was discussed. And I, I feel that there is um, a real problem the way this was in that con 
encapsulated it as the two items. Basically, let's get rid of age-based discounts for seniors, but hey, we'll, we'll raise the threshold, not one step, but two steps to the highest possible. And this is where I had the problem um, with, with, with the proposal, because age-based discounts, in some sense, is a rite of passage. And it's, it's you know, you've, you've survived having children. If you had children, you survived putting them through school. You survived paying off your mortgage. You've done all these things to get where you are. And certainly there are some citizens that may be having a public sector fully indexed 2% increase in their pension every year. Great for them. They made a great career choice. Wonderful. But those that have not, and those that will take advantage of this, are a limited number at this point, according to the staff report of about 15% of the potentially eligible seniors. I think it's more of a virtue signaling exercise that we're basically saying, you seniors have worked so hard to get where you are, make great choices, you make more money now than you ever did because you planned accordingly, so let's penalize you and let's redistribute your wealth. Let's point kick of order. you in the pants. Uh, point of order? I believe the rules of order uh, indicate that the code of conduct should be followed, which involves not imputing the motives of staff. So, um, what, what, so, we can't, well, well, well. so this is what I would say. It's not a point of order. I think you could argue a point of privilege on the term virtue signaling, because that, in my view, does speak to motive. So I'll ask you not to use that term, but you can continue. I lost my train of thought. Shall I get my few minutes back? No. Okay. You, you still That's, have you still have uh, lots of time on the clock. Okay. Uh, e essentially, I'm not about to offend the seniors in my district, and I am going to be voting yes in the, uh, towards the negative motion to defeat this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Councillor Hutchison. Well, this is certainly an important policy, and I've been back and forth myself to some degree. Um, this got started, yes, it got hard started with the Mayor's Task Force on Poverty Reduction. I was on that, so there were general suggestions, but um, really um, the My Kingston um, initiative started with uh, the two people over here. Um, Ms. Hurdle, who was not the acting interim CAO, can't keep up with your titles, and the now commissioner, uh, <laughs> the um, Sheila Kidd, who brought us at our request to the art committee, Councillor Sanic will remember that, maybe there was somebody else, the, um, the suggestion that we put the transit in the uh, and um, recreation together, which was, we took is just brilliant, <laughs> okay? It addressed a huge number of issues for people, including seniors. So we've always been pressing for a better number, okay? Because we realized thousands of people who were economically pressed, or even by definition poor, did not qualify, okay? They brought us the numbers on that, and we just went, I could just remember the committee, like everybody sat back and said, oh my God, right? <laughs> the cost of this, right? So just to me, I appreciate what this is. We deferred it the first time uh, because of the issues that have been brought up, okay? <laughs> Tonight, yet again. And I appreciate the councillors that are supporting the, the, the option C because it's a better good. There's no doubt about that. But is it the best good? And should we be going for the best good? And that's what bothered me because I'm concerned about what we call middle income person but really isn't, okay? Just to give you an example, I was at the Housing Task Force the other day, and I had analyzed, based on provincial uh, uh, documentation statistics, how many people, how many households are, um, would, would qualify for housing subsidy based on their gross income. 
it's between 50 and 60 percent of all households would qualify. At 60 percent, the average the, the average two bedroom is twelve hundred dollars. It's 60 percent of households going up, of course. Um, that means that um, that the um, at 60 percent households that they could afford 1,220 based on the income that in the for renters, okay? They separated out owners from renters. The people that are 50 percent, basically the median for households and down, those are the people I'm concerned about. They're getting cut off here. Part of the problem with the report, and I, I said this before, and I asked for this, but it didn't come back in that form, I asked for it in 2017, is it's after-tax income. Now, that works for some of the analysis, so, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag. But without the gross income for those uh, folks, you cannot tell whether they make the 30% uh, uh, income issue for those on what they can afford for household rent, which is the, one of the main ways in which we determine who's poor and who isn't. Okay? So who gets left out here? Well, the people between those who have enough, which has been described, and it quite rightly exists, but they're pulling up the average. It's the people that I remember who have said to me, don't, do, don't take it away, because 30, it means something to equality in my life. I'll be done in two seconds. Okay, seconds. So I ran on this. It's in my literature. You can go read it. They said, I wouldn't take away the senior's discount. So for those two reasons, the analytical side and the fact I made a promise, I won't vote for C. I might vote for G if we raise the level. Which, I remember another counselor, won't point to them, but they're here, uh, who said, oh, maybe if they, even in 2017, if they raise the level, Thank then we would do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Ostroff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. And I do want to speak to it as well. I really, really appreciate um, everyone's comments because, uh, like uh, Councillor Hutchison, I, I, I can see both sides uh, of this one. And I have not received a lot of phone calls, um, but um, I have received um, um, some, and they asked me not to support uh, this one. So, but um, most of the comments I have from seniors that I've asked is that they that we would continue some age-based discounts, but uh, whatever level. But um, I really do really hear uh, Councillor Kiley and. Uh, and, and his thoughts on it, I appreciate them. Um, I just don't think it's going to be the right thing to completely cut off the age-based discounts. People are looking for it, are expecting it, and feel that they deserve it. And um, I, it, um, it might be, it might be feel disrespectful to them. So uh, I hear that. I, I, I do acknowledge that many, many of our, our and it's, thankfully, we have a, a community of uh, seniors. Um, I don't think seniors will take the discount if they don't need it. So, um, so I, um, I will not be supporting uh, option C as well, but I look forward to something like G and uh, making, uh, maybe adjusting those numbers a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I take the chair and recognize you. Thank you. So I think it's pretty clear that we have a collision between good policy and good politics. I think we all recognize that. So there have been some comments about how, well, this is two separate issues. There's the age-based and the needs-based, and maybe we should look at option G because it's just a little bit more expensive. But let's be real. If we're going to expand needs-based discounts and not do anything with age-based discounts, that's simply not affordable. It's not affordable. There's simply no way to make that work unless we want to start to raise the tax rates. There's no way. It's unaffordable now. It's only going to increase the level of unaffordability in the years ahead. So I think we need to recognize that right up front. So what we're grappling with is, is there a way that we can somehow expand needs-based discounts so that we can do more for low-income seniors. At the same time, is there a way where we don't have to take something away that people currently enjoy? 
That's basically the issue. This is what we're all grappling with. So I am intending, if option C does not pass, and by the math, it's not going to pass. So my intention is to put forward a compromise option that will grandfather existing age-based discounts. In other words, nobody that has their age-based discount today will lose it. It's only looking forward that we will phase it out, and that will give us enough room to at least raise the threshold on needs-based from LICO to LIM. Now, I fully recognize that may be a compromise that doesn't satisfy either side, but at least in my view, that's a potential common ground, is how do you find that balance between good policy and good politics? Now, I recognize I'm probably bending the rules a little bit, Deputy Mayor, because I'm sort of speaking to another option that's not actually option C, but that is why I'm gonna put that forward, that ultimately, if option C is going to fail, then if there's another option that's forward, something that is financially doable, that doesn't take anybody's existing discount away, and can actually expand needs-based discounts so that we can do more for low-income seniors, that, in my view, is the way to hit all three. So thank you very much. I yield the chair to you. <clears throat> okay, so is there anybody else that has not spoken to this that would like to? Councilor McLaren, you have the floor. Okay, I'm not gonna take too much time because there's only two comments that have been made that um, I felt need to be addressed and haven't. So uh, the first one is about disposable income. Um, while you're healthy, your disposable income might actually be higher after you retire but you're not gonna be healthy forever. And there are costs to that, including the costs of your house. And the idea that this is not affordable, we just spent 180 million on a bridge. I think that we can afford 200,000. Um, we also spent, we are committed to another 1.5 million on upkeep for that bridge. We can afford this, that's not a problem. But going forward, um, I also promised, like Councillor Hutchison, not to take away or touch the um, seniors' discounts, so it's a uh, promise that I made. However, I am willing to go with uh, consensus on what proper limb level we should be at. Uh, so for that reason, I cannot support C, but I can su certainly support F or G. Thank you. Okay. Point of order, if Point I can. Uh, I mentioned to you before, Council, that I would be asking about uh, for you to rule on the uh, potential of separating uh, the first two that clauses from the last two that clauses. Since they, the way they read are okay. as okay, just separate just recommendations. Just let me have a look at it. Mr. Kirk, can I see you for a moment? Okay, so, okay, so here would be my ruling, Councillor Neal. So the last two clauses would effectively move, go with any of the options. So separating, the last two clauses do not apply to option C. That's correct, and that's what the intent of my, mo uh, my motion to separate those. Okay. So the reason why we wouldn't separate that now is to allow for another option to come on the floor that would have those two clauses. So if nothing passes and we're left with status quo, then you could put those two clauses on the floor at the end. Does that make sense? 
Yes, so my understanding then is if we vote with the recommendation and their vote for vote option C down, mm -hmm. we would be in a place where we could then move uh, that staff continue to make operational improvements and that staff will conduct a review because those are separate uh, right. intents. Right. Okay. But, I, but I'm only going to permit that at the end once any other options have been. Okay. But um, if we vote all of this down, those two things won't make. Option G say uh, contrary. No, because the thing is is contained as one one recommendation. So another option can come forward with those same those same two pieces attached. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, everyone clear on that? Councilor Doherty, point of order. Uh, point of clarification. Okay, <laughs> sure. The rec your recommendation. Can you just go over that? Was that the limb plus 15, or just clarifying what you were recommending? Yeah. So I don't, I don't think that I can do that. I think that that's, that's not really a point of order. So I think we'll just have to just go, go with your, your gut on that. So we are really just at procedural questions right now. So just to remind council, so we're going to do the vote on this. So a vote of yes, is confirming the decision of the Administrative Policies Committee to say no. So if you do not want option C, you will vote yes. If on the other hand, you do want option C, then you will vote no. Everybody clear? Exactly. Okay, so we will call the vote on number two. And that carries by a vote of nine to four. So option C has lost. Now I will entertain other options to put on the floor. Councillor Holland. Thanks, Your Worship. Option E, please. Okay. Do we have a motion for option E? Can I see that? Was there a seconder for that? I, so, is it on. on the floor? Okay, so Councillor Holland has moved option E. Is there a seconder for option E? Councillor Osterhoff? Okay, so option E is now on the floor. Po point okay. of order? Point of order. Would that be contrary to uh, the fact that we just turned down no. age no. base? No, so my ruling is that Option C was what was turned down, and that included all the details of option C. So that means that every other option is still very much in order. Can, can I ask a, a question of staff related to the option on the floor? If you'll recognize me or recognize yes, when, me later. Yes, when we get to it, but right now, Councillor Holland has the floor because it's her, her motion. Councillor Holland? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, well, I think this... This, this seems to be a compromise that touches on the conflict that you've indicated that is apparent between policy and politics, um, where we see a way to make dis discounts more sustainable financially, um, while still recognizing that the age-based income, the age-based discounts are valuable and that we are concerned about taking something away uh, this the some of the I'm sure the questions are around what the discount come levels are at I'll wait for staff to comment on that but they are approximately 20 25 percent so this is not a dramatic discount or change in that discount while we still get to see um, the uh, the the amount the income threshold that is most appropriate for ensuring that we meet our objectives of reducing poverty and also ensuring accessibility municipal services. 
Okay, Councillor Neal. My concern, and I should have brought this up when we were debating about option C, but my concern is if we're talking about age-based, both our youth and our ch children's free passes are indeed age-based and they're age-based discounts. So do, is this a slippery slope where we're putting in jeopardy a really popular uh, program whereby students and children get free uh, bus passes? Okay, so you've if, if, that, if that's the case, and I can't see, I can't understand reading the, the wording of this, how that wouldn't be a slippery slope to a rationale for getting rid of that. And if you think uh, seniors pushing back against this is bad, try taking it away from children and, and youth. So, so perhaps... Councilor Neal's asked a question. Ms. Hitchin. Thank you. Through you, Mayor. Um, this will not impact the programs that you mentioned. Children are excluded from this conversation. Um, the second clause up there is about standardizing the ages because between recreation, culture, and transit, there are different age categories. Uh, so as part of this process, we want to standardize those definitions. So a child is a child is a child. Um, but the uh, programs with the post-secondary institutions, the uh, recreation program and the public school system, all of those uh, programs are not impacted by this. Um, so this change that's up there in option C just reduces the level of the current age-based discounts that are under consideration from the current level of 20 and 25% down to 15% across the board. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wish the wording was more clear in there or that it, it said specifically that. Uh, but I, I w won't be supporting this because I still think our best option, as pre some previous speakers have, have pointed out, is option G. And I think uh, the opportunity to, and quite frankly, I mean, people spoke about how progressive option C was, the most progressive option presented to us is option G. And therefore, uh, if we can defeat this, perhaps we can put the most progressive option on the floor. Okay, is there anybody else that wishes to speak to option E? Councillor Stroud. Simply to say that I understand the rationale for the compromise, but we'll get the, we'll get the same reaction from the public uh, with a reduction as we would with a flat out elimination, I think. It, it doesn't, it, the nuance of the compromise will get lost in, the, in, in, in this whole thing, I, I'm afraid. I do agree with Councillor Neil about option G. I have an unresolved problem though, and that is the estimates used for the table. The cost estimates, we heard about the 15% of uh, eligible seniors that are actually using the discount. We, um, there's moving targets, there's moving uh, the demographic shifts, there's uh, <laughs> projected revenue loss. Okay, so that's what transit fares we're not collecting, theoretically, you know? That's, that's included in that number. What we need are better numbers for option G before we vote on option G, but I will have to vote against option E, unfortunately. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else who wishes to speak to option E? Uh, Councillor Holland, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship. So um, I think it's pretty clear where I stand on the issue altogether, so I won't be speaking anymore, but just wanted to take this opportunity to say a couple more things. Um, the so something needs to change. I mean, the current discount system is really unfair 
it's, it's, it's disgraceful to think that someone on, that's earning $17,400 a, a year is not getting a discount. Uh, and that someone who is, is retired or, or in whatever circumstance, regardless, that their income is significantly higher and they receive no discount. However you want to justify that, that is wrong. Um, the, and if we don't change it tonight, it will not change. We will continue with a LICO system, which is a cutoff of $17,000 approximately. The, I certainly acknowledge that individuals living on fixed income, seniors who are retired, have difficulties. They have health care costs that, that others don't have. They have limited income. I certainly get the, the rationale. My parents work their whole lives. They can't afford home care. This is not, um, you know, but that is not what this program is meant to be doing. It's not meant to be a retirement benefit for someone. It's meant to be a needs-based program. That's how it was initiated. And I, and I would simply like to have us reflect on the intention of it. It's not like it's easy to, to say the things I've been saying. I get contacted by people who tell me that they'll never elect me, I will never be electable ever again because of this decision. If you're not hearing from a resident who's earning $17,400, I can tell you why you're not hearing from them. You're not hearing from them because they're busy trying to do what they need to do to survive. And we're here to represent them just as much as we're here to represent any other age group or any other demographic. That's it for me. Okay, so uh, at this point, then we will take a vote on option E. Now, notice that now we switch to the positive. So what that means is that if you want option E, you will vote yes. If you don't want option E, then you will vote no. Councillor Stroud, point of order. Is, is, uh, are, are clauses two, three, and four included with this motion? Uh, can I can I just see the uh, can I see the motion again? Yes. So you'll see that those same final two clauses are now connected to option E. Okay. So that's what we're voting on right there. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hitchin. Through you, Your Worship, I just noticed there's an error in the second clause that I thought I better correct before you vote on it. Um, the adult age group for this particular option should be 25 to 64, not 18 to 64, because we're maintaining the youth discounts for the 15 to 24-year-olds. So okay, uh, adults should start at uh, 25. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. So it's 25 to 64. Okay, everyone, any other process questions? Okay, everybody's clear now with that change? Okay. Okay, we will call the vote on option E. Please vote. And that loses by a vote of six to seven. Okay, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I take the chair and recognize you. Thank you. At this point, I would like to put forward option J. Oh, okay, some option with the grandfathering, phasing out of age-based discounts and, uh, and an increase to limb. Point of order, could I... Could I request, is that the one on the, now on the board? Yes. Okay. So if I can speak to it? Please, Deputy you Mayor. have the floor. Okay. So I'm just gonna come back and circle back to my earlier comments, and I understand what we're grappling with, that there's three things that we're looking for. Number one, to try not to take something away that people currently enjoy. Number two, to expand the standard uh, of, of uh, assistance to those that need it. And number three, something that... Point of order, sorry, Mayor Patterson. Yeah. We need a seconder. Oh, I yeah. missed asking for that. Would someone second option J, which is the blank option J? A seconder for this? Councillor Hill, thank you. And Thank you. 
So, Mr. so just Clark. to be clear, the original option J, this is just another option that's being presented. J doesn't exist within the report. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I will try not to throw out random letters. <laughs> uh, it's getting late. Yes. Um, so I, I just come back to the three things I think we're grappling with. Number one is not taking away something that already exists that people enjoy. Number two, something that it can expand assistance to people that need it. And number three, something that is financially manageable. Now, there have been some comments earlier to dismiss it that, oh, it's no big deal. These are operating dollars that ultimately are going to increase year after year after year. So just to be clear, some of the other options that have been suggested are actually more expensive than what we already have. So I'm looking for something that can at least hold the line. This is something that ultimately can at least keep the cost more or less the same, but provides a shift that, in my view, is more palatable. So that's why I put this forward. I understand it's a compromise. So I guess the question that I would ask of every councillor is, right, do you want to compromise or do you want to risk getting something very different from what you really want? That ultimately is what every compromise is about. If this is something you can live with, in my view, you should vote for this. In my view, this at least tries to hit everything. It doesn't satisfy everybody around this table, but I think that this is something that we can argue is a reasonable move. It addresses the issue that the current system will become increasingly unaffordable, but at the same time is something that will not take away anything from a resident in this Kingston. Anybody that has a senior's discount today will continue to enjoy that senior's discount. So with that, I reserve the right to speak last, but I offer it for Council's consideration. Thank you. I yield the chair to you. Sorry, point of order. Mr. Clerk, do I keep the chair because it was the mayor's motion moving it? Okay, my apologies. Would anyone like to speak to option blank? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Councillor Hutchison. I should have stuck it in his eye. The, uh, <laughs> written on his eyeball. The, um, <clears throat> my, I'm fine with um, uh, clause two, three, four, and five. The um, phasing it out, um, I suppose that's a silent way of doing it, maybe. Um, I, I think there's another route here, actually, and uh, it seems to have got lost in the shuffle, and that is to um, increase the, um, the low-income measure after tax, adopt that, but also um, come up with a rather than a universal seniors discount, come up with a, you know, a seniors discount. The one that's proposed here in the thing seems too low. It's 15%. Uh, so that you know what effect you're having on what size of population. That you can't figure out from this, this report. And so that's why I was talking about gross numbers, so people would have a better idea what income Groups they're actually affecting, and um, and 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 so um, I'm going to I'm going to move a deferral so that we can find that information out. I'm not necessarily saying this is wrong. It could be right. Uh, maybe council likes the idea, but um, I think it's cr it's kind of crude actually. So in my view, no offense to the mayor, the. Um, and so I would like to um, move deferral for s staff to look at um, um, a, what are we calling this? Uh, discounted fees, municipal programs, and services that allows for the LIM plus 15 and um, Ports back on the, the level of um, seniors, senior discounts. Point, so, point, point of order? Mm -hmm. 
nothing to what Councillor Hutchison's saying, but just noting it's 10.45, so. Yes. But, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'll let you take care of that. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. I was gonna say, uh, before we talk about or discuss and vote on a motion to defer, could I have someone waive the bylaw to extend the meeting until the completion of agenda? Uh, Correct. Councillor Neal, second by Councillor Osanic. And we'll vote on that. Please vote. That passes. So back to the motion to defer. Can you repeat the language, please? No, I'm trying. I'll try and remember. Okay. The um, to defer. The discounted fees for municipal program services proposal um, to examine an, an option which retains or advances, I guess, because we haven't done it, the uh, LIM plus 15 with um, a seniors discount system that is set at um, at the level of um, what I, well I'll tell you what I want I'm not quite sure to put this but what I want to do is set it at where you find people are paying more than thirty percent of their income for a household and, rent. And do you point, have time or place? Oh, point, point of order. order. Uh, just a suggestion, Mr. Deputy Mayor, is that perhaps we could take a five minute recess to actually write that down because I feel that in sure. the motion to defer, exactly what is being asked for is pretty important. Yeah, Thank fair you. enough. I, Thank I, you. I my, discretion. my point of order was, if I can, was that you sound like you're amending the motion, not deferring it. If we can defer it for time and place, I can support that. Okay. Oh, okay, well I just hadn't got there, but sure, fair enough. So we'll need a motion to recess. Mover, Councillor Bowen, seconder, Councillor Stroud. Five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you. Councillors, please don't leave. We need you to vote. Councillor Neal, we need you to vote. Uh, it does say motion to defer. Please uh, accept that this is a motion to recess. You can vote now. Need one more? Oh wait, we need to reconvene. And I was incorrect initially. We did need to vote for that second five minute recess. So if you haven't, it's on the screen. Please vote for something that just happened. All right, if councillors could take their seat, please. Again, I misspoke. We did need to vote on the recess. There was a motion to recess on the board, and I misinstructed you. Please vote in favor of something that just happened. All right, so we're back. That was a really quick five minutes. Now, to the mover of the deferral, motion to defer, do you have time and place? I do. Um, turns out that 
we can defer that motion, but it'll come back exactly as it's up there. And so um, I'm not going to make the deferral. I think we have to defeat that motion. This way I see it, defeat that motion, and then um, go, from, go from there. Because what I wanted to do is, is to some, time of, Yeah, point okay. of order, time and place. Time and place. You're withdrawing your motion to defer? Um, Just clarifying, you're yeah, no longer I'll, moving to defer. I won't move to defer. So we're back to the motion on the board about having the limb after tax as the income measure while keeping the seniors discount. Does anyone else wish to speak? Councillor Stroud. I uh, would like to move deferral to the Administrative Policies Committee so that staff can give uh, an analysis of this option in the context of the previous report and so that pub members of the public who may wish to speak can do so at committee. You have place, do you have time? So the next meeting of the Administrative Policies Committee. And further study on this motion. Well, yeah, well that's what I'm deferring, yes. Right. This is the motion I'm deferring. Motion to defer, seconder. Councillor Chappelle, anyone on time or place? Motion to defer. Point to border. A uh, question of clarification. If we were to defer this, will option G still be a possibility at a later date? Mr. Clerk, perhaps Councillor McLaren, you could repeat your question. If we were to defer this motion to admin policies, will option G also be there as well? And when it returns from administrative policies back to council, will option G also be one of the options at that point? Through Mr. Mayor, or Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, all options would be available in the sense that if the motion that comes back is defeated, then an alternative option could be presented at that time. So the short answer to that question is yes. Point of order. If I'm able to do that as chair, I'm not sure. Since you're the chair, you can just ask the clerk. Okay. Right. Option C and option E have been defeated. Would they also come back? No. Thank you. I saw a hand. Councillor Bohm speaking to you. Time or place for deferral? Yes, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and through you to time. Would deferring to the next admin policies meeting give enough time for staff to gather the required data and provide notice to the public who may want to provide input on this, or would a, the meeting after that be more appropriate? Is a question to staff, I guess. Uh, I can't speak to the public consultation component because I'm not sure what we're asking the public, but in terms of this particular option, costing out the option, which I think is what you're looking for as compared to the other option, uh, that could definitely uh, come to the next admin policy meeting. Acting CAO Hurdle, Hurdle interim CAO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, um, Deputy Mayor. So in terms of uh, public input, um, the information would definitely post it on the city website, uh, and the public could attend Administrative Policies Committee and provide um, their feedback at that time as well. Thank you. Time or place, motion to defer. To admin Paul, next meeting, with opportunity for public consultation, further public consultation. Going once, twice, we'll call the vote. And it passes. I yield the chair to you.
Thank you. Thankfully. Very, thank you very much, Deputy Mayor, and thank you for uh, navigating that last component. Okay, so we are back to report number 70. On to item three, appointment of the auditor for the 29th fiscal year. You will call the vote, please. And that carries. Okay, report number 71 from the Environment, Infrastructure, and Transportation Policies Committee. I have here said report, and it's moved and seconded uh, for Council's consideration. Moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Councillor Doherty, that report number 71 from the Environment, Infrastructure, and Transportation Policies Committee be received and adopted. Okay, so there are two clauses. Uh, we can vote on them together unless anyone has any questions or wishes to speak to them individually. Okay, seeing none, then number, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Councillor Osdorff, you want to speak to one of them? Okay, so then we'll separate them. So first, uh, number one is the City of Kingston Road Safety Plan. Councillor Osdorff. I just thought there would be more discussion, so I, I'll come up with something. Um, <laughs> I'll give you guys a chance to think about it. You're all wore out from the last one. Okay. Um, I, I, obviously, the, the road safety plan, um, we've had good discussion um, in committee. Um, I, I, I guess I did phone today for some questions, and I just thought there'd be clarification on uh, the um, um, the cameras and that, and, and, and how that would... Um, I, I, could we have an explanation on cameras for the in the vulnerable areas and in in uh, in, in traffic um, in intersections of high risk? Can we have some more explanation of that? Uh, yes, um, Mr. Sub. Uh, through your your worship, uh, yes, Councillor Ustaf. So. Um, a component of the road safety plan, it's built along a, a number of emphasis areas, and within those emphasis areas are uh, specific countermeasures. So a counter, some of the countermeasures that are included speak to automated enforcement. Right. Um, the automated enforcement um, components that are um, available to the city uh, in the short term are centered around uh, red light camera systems. Uh, and then there are options in the future pending sort of provincial regulatory changes that would relate to uh, automated speed or photo radar enforcement. And the, in, the intent is that there would be a follow-up report specific to the red light camera implementation that would be brought um, to council prior to the end of the year. All right, thanks. And so uh, there, there would be cameras potentially then in, in the rural community as well, in the schools and, uh, and, and, and lights, or is that is that mostly an urban focus? Uh, I think with respect to with respect to the red light camera program, um, I think those locations would be part of what we would um, be bringing forward uh, for discussion with with council in the future. Um, but the intent is that all of these countermeasures are are citywide countermeasures okay. that would be deployed based on sort of data that suggests their um, th that they would be appropriate at certain locations. And um, is there costs? Like, what are the costs? Like, what uh, will we be? Need, will, will we have access to that too? Of how much we want to invest in that, or that will be presented at another time? Uh, through you, Your Worship. Yes. So uh, the specific uh, details related to um, the red light camera program or other automated enforcement um, components would would be contained within that report. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next on my list is Councillor Osanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just to keep <laughs> Councillor Osahoff uh, company, um, there was a timely article in the Toronto Star on Saturday, and I just wondered if staff saw it. It was the City of Toronto's Vision Zero. And uh, in the article, it talked about 
the most important thing that they've taken, like they, they initiated Vision Zero in 2016, and the most important takeaway, you know, three years later is um, road design. That's the heart of where they can try to make a difference is in road design because focusing on public education or other things doesn't seem to be working. It has to be a design, like a, a change in the design of the road. And I just wondered if staff saw that article. It says all over this article in the Toronto Star, the physical redesign of the road is what's needed. And in the recommendations of our road safety plan, I think that is an emphasis, and that's my question. I, th I think I remember that being an emphasis, and is it? Uh, through your, your worship, uh, so yes, I think uh, the, the information that you're referring to from, from that article, it, it, that, is, that was part of the work that was done for Kingston's road safety plan work, in that the, the countermeasures that are that are prescribed as part of the plan and the emphasis areas that sort of look at at where the city would be focusing it's all based around um, four e's so engineering education enforcement and engagement the road design aspect of it or the engineering aspect of it is a very important piece of it um, in that in that the overall design of the road is the best way to encourage the behaviors of all of the users on that road, but particularly the vehicle users and the speeds at which they're traveling. And those, those components, I think that's reflected in the plan. It's, it's understood within the plan. However, I think it's also, it's also understood within, within the work we're doing that the, that the changes to the design of the overall transportation network of the city will take time. And uh, there are a number of other countermeasures or programs that are proposed that are designed to act as interim measures um, uh, in, in the interim. Okay, so we call the vote on clause one, please. Waiting for two to vote. Still waiting for one. And that carries. Number two, options for single-use plastics reduction. Call the vote, please. Waiting for one more, please. And that carries. Okay, moving on, we have nothing from Committee of the Whole. Information reports, if you have a question, just raise your hand as I read through them. Number one, radon mitigation strategy overview. Councillor Sanic. Thank you, Your Worship. Just looking for my notes. Um, I did have um, a couple of questions. Let me just see. Um, right, okay, so. The new requirements that um, the city has as of September 1st, um, do we think that that will be enough or um, are we going to try out those measures, those requirements for a, short, for a short time and then somehow assess to see if we have to go any further steps? Are there further steps to go? So right now we're saying um, it has to be ventilated outside and uh, I can't remember what the other one was, but we're not saying that it needs waterproofing underneath a foundation to create like an impermeable membrane. Um, so are we saying that the two, recommend, two requirements that we have as of September 1st, is that far enough? And would we assess to see if there's a difference at some point down to see if we have to go even further? Ms. Governor Hunt. For you, Mr. Mayor, um, the building code prescribes those three options that are in the strategy. So the one option is to seal the floor, wall, and, and any penetrations. 
The other is to put a rough in under the slab. And then the third is to do a full remedial mitigation, mitigation system. That's an, the three options the customers have. There is no remediation measures under the code, so those are just soil gas measures um, to put in place. The remediation is done by others, so there, there wouldn't be any other, um, any other requirements under the code unless the province were to put something else in place. So uh, the province is looking at harmonizing with the National Building Code, and the National Building Code has the rough in under the slab as mandatory requirement. So if we do move with the harmonization, then that will be put in every dwelling. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Number two, your story is our history, Sir John A. 360 engagement events update. Okay, we have no information reports, members of council. Miscellaneous business that the resignation of Ashley Johnson from Heritage Kingston be received with regret. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Doherty, seconded by Councillor Neal. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, we have uh, one new motion, so I'll turn it over to the Deputy Mayor, please. I take the chair and recognize you. Actually, what if you could read the motion? Oh, and just, just moved uh, by you, yes. Moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Councillor Osanic. That the following members of council be appointed to the Chief Administrative Officer Recruitment Committee, Mayor Patterson, Councillor Chappelle, Councillor Doherty, Councillor Holland, and Councillor Hutchison. To have the floor. Thank you. I, I think that the motion is self-explanatory. Obviously, this is a, a key piece in our recruitment for a new CAO. I think that the only thing that I will say is, having spoken with council, um, that my goal was to create a, a committee that is diverse on several different fronts. Uh, there's a diversity of political leanings. There is a diversity of tenure, uh, from veterans to, uh, to new councillors. Uh, and then also on gender as well. So certainly hope that council can support this. And obviously we will move forward with our recruitment over the next uh, couple of months. And again, ultimately it will be all of council that will make the final decision on the new CAO. So thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to new motion number one? Any further comments from the mover? We'll call the vote. <laughs> Waiting for one vote, please. And it passes, 13-0. Yield the chair to you. Thank you very much. So moving on, are there any notices of motion? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Clerk, House from minutes, please. Moved by count. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Hutchison, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 2019 20, held Tuesday, August 13th, 2019, be confirmed. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, we have some tabling of documents, a number of communications. Is there any other business? Motion to adjourn, please. Move. Oh, a bylaw. <laughs> Sorry, I wish. Okay, Ms. Clerk, ask for bylaws, please. Moved by Councillor Osanic, seconded by Councillor Hill, that bylaws 1 through 10, 15, and 14 be given their first and second reading. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Hill, that Clause 11.36 of Bylaw 2010-1 be suspended for the purpose of giving Bylaw 4 three readings. Please vote. That carries. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Hill, that bylaws 4 through 13, 15, and 14 be given their third reading. Please vote. Yeah. 
And that carries. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Deputy Mayor Kiley, seconded by Councillor Bohm. Please vote. And that carries. Thank you very much.